All right, first thing we need to do is ask ourselves, what are we gonna be doing on the computer? And this is what's gonna determine what processor we're gonna need for the computer, okay? After we find out what processor we're gonna need for the computer, then we can move on to selecting the motherboard. Then from there, everything else is going to be smooth sailing. All right, so for all of you basic bitches out there, <laughs> please don't take any offense to that. What I mean by basic bitches is for all of you out there that just wanna learn how to build a computer for basic stuff, as in, oh, I don't know, maybe you wanna type out a book on Microsoft Word, maybe you wanna do PowerPoint presentations for your business, you wanna show your employees, you know, how your business is performing with analytics and systematic information with pie graphs and charts and may, or maybe you work for Wall Street and you want to watch charts all damn day. Same with cryptocurrencies. Maybe you are a gamer also and you want to play 2D games like, I don't know, Minesweeper <laughs> or maybe Pogo.com. <laughs> it's an awesome website I used to use when I was little. Pop it. That, was, that game was a shit. That's on Pogo.com. <laughs> or... You know, maybe you're just wanting to build a computer for grandma. Or, you know, maybe you want to install emulators to your computer as well, like uh, Atari, Super Nintendo, Nintendo, and Sega. You know, basically anything that does not require high graphical output. For all of those people I just mentioned that do all of those things, and you don't even have to do all those things, just choose one or any of them, okay? Dual core processor, minimum. Stay away from single core processors, they're shit, they're garbage, and with technology, how it has came today, single core processors are trash. Now, I usually highly recommend to those same people though, however, if you could spend just a teeny bit more money to get a quad core processor, only because of two reasons. One, it will speed up your computer way more than a dual core processor will anyway. And on top of that, for all you gamers out there, it will give you more leeway for if you do change your mind in the future and you do want to purchase a separate graphics card down the line, you know, to play on the uh, high graphical games, like, oh, I don't know, like PlayStation Xbox type graphics, like Call of Duty, Battlefield, Arma, PUBG, EVE Online, Mortal Kombat, Grand Theft Auto, There's really any game you can play on a PlayStation or Xbox, but play on your PC, okay? But don't count on being able to video stream or video record. Which leads me to the next group of people. The people that actually want to video stream and record as well as doing everything else I just fucking mentioned. Octa-core processor. AKA 8 core processor. Then anything else past that, like, uh, oh, I don't know, if you want to increase your video encoding performance, like after you edit a video and stuff like that, or maybe you want more uh, power for your computer to help with streaming needs, or uh, maybe you get, you're getting into machine learning, AI machine learning software that I use to uh, for video enhancement, or maybe you're a video game developer, programming code, having a faster compiling of your code. Then 16 core processor and higher. And obviously the more cores you have after that, the faster everything I just mentioned will be. And if you're still confused, then I'll put it right here, a little graph that you can actually read. It'll be much, much, much easier instead of just listening to everything I just fuck said. <laughs> Then again, you probably all have already listened to everything I just fucking said. Like, it really matters. <laughs> don't worry, I put timestamps in this video so you can just jump to the sections that you don't really need to learn about. Alrighty then. First, here's all the cool things you can do on PC. Mama. 
money's on me, kicking your bitch ass all night long. <laughs> Up yours! Oh, yeah. <laughs> Magic don't even work! What are you is he doing? <laughs> what the fuck is going on here? Why is he fucking walking backwards? He's running backwards, what the fuck? <laughs> Weird. Yo ho, yo ho, pirate's life for me. <laughs> I haven't cut open a man in a while. <laughs> 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 You can use the keyboard and mouse, obviously, but the best part is, is yeah. Yeah, I have a PlayStation 5 controller plugged in, and I'm using a program called DS4 Windows Background, which basically converts this controller into, like, a Microsoft Xbox controller. As you see the bottom, you know, A for OK, Y for Quit, and there's no A or Y button on this controller. But you get a drill idea, so you can, like, switch to and from whenever you want. You can just keep it plugged in, and you can also use the keyboard and mouse uh, whenever you want as well. And then as you can see the bottom buttons change as you switch to whatever you're using. Oh, and if you really want to get down to it, you can use more than one different type of controller at the exact same time in certain PC games. Even PlayStation 1 and PlayStation 2 and all those other retro games on your computer. Pretty much any PC game or retro game that supports more than one player. For example, me and my buddy played NBA Ballers on PlayStation 2 via the PlayStation 2 emulator. And he used the Xbox controller, whereas I used the PlayStation 5 controller. We both played the exact same time. Two different USB ports, PC plugged into my 8K television. And you can mix it up too, you can have one person use keyboard and mouse, another person use an Xbox controller. Or maybe he wants to use the mouse and keyboard and you want to use PlayStation controller instead of the Xbox controller, vice versa. Hell, if you really, really wanted to, you could probably go online and buy some USB Super Nintendo controllers and then use those to play PlayStation 2 games. I don't know why you would, because... <laughs> but you can if you want, you're just going to be limited. <laughs> Since PS1 and PS2 has more buttons that needs to be used for their games. <laughs> Then you got trainers for your PC games, which consoles do not have. And basically, they just give you free cheat codes you can activate by a press of a button. You might be thinking, oh, well, who the hell you know, wants to cheat in their games? That ruins everything. Well, first of all, I don't do it online. If you cheat online, you're a dick. I don't agree with that. But sometimes, cheat codes can make games more fun. For example, Grand Theft Auto. Back in the day, I grew up with Code Breaker, Game Shark, Action Replay, and stuff like that. And there was a couple cheats, like one where you can actually be in a car and have the radio playing and everything. And then when you get out of the car, you can press L1 and R1 at the exact same time on your controller and the radio will still be playing. And you can change the radio stations while you're walking around killing people. It's so like you're not even in the car anymore, but you can have the radio play, including change the radio stations and everything while you're walking around and stuff. You got that, and then you like to cheat like where you can hold L1 on your controller and then have literally all the vehicles in front of you just fly up in the air as long as you're holding it. Then you can let go of L1 and then all the cars drop to the ground. <laughs> I like to use cheat like that for like target practice, so I hold L1, make the cars fly up in the air, and then use a rocket launcher, shoot, it, shoot them <laughs> in the air. So you got stuff like that. To me, cheat codes make games more fun because it gives you more ways to play your game. That's how I look at it. But anyways, you got free trainers, and you also got paid trainers. Free trainer like Wiimod, free applications, download it, then search for your game, 
and then it should have cheat codes uh, for your games. Like, for example, Mortal Kombat 11, unlimited health, unlimited attack, unlimited defense, weak opponents, unlimited fatal attacks. You can do the, like, the x-ray attacks all the fuck time. Over and over and over and over again. Free crypt boxes. You can unlock everything in the crypt for free. You don't have to pay for any of them. <laughs> you got stuff like that. Then you got free trainers you can download from, you know, forum websites. Like, it's from, like, personal developers that make their own trainers for the games like that. Side effect is you have to actually sign up for their website, and, which is usually free, but you sign up for the website anyway and uh, to be able to get the download link to download the trainer for the game. Then you got paid trainers like Cheat Happens here. I'm not promoting them. I paid for them, but only because they are usually the first people, the very first people to come out with the trainer as soon as a PC game is released. So as soon as a PC game hit, hits you know, the digital store, they're on it. They have a trainer before anybody else comes up with one. For one, for two, I've also noticed that every single time an update for a game occurs, they're usually on it and provide an update to their trainer because that's what most trainers have to do. They have to update the trainers to so the cheats can still work on the updated game. When, you know, games release their updates, you know how that goes. <laughs> Oh crap, I can't play the game. There's an update first. Now you might be asking, well, why would you want to use several different types of trainers? Why not just use one for your game? That's a good question. Some trainers don't have certain cheat codes that you want. For example, cheat happens, even though it's paid. <laughs> it's a paid software. It's like 50 or 60 for life. But you can get any trainer you want for any PC game you want. And like I said, they're usually the first to come out with a trainer. But I guess that's also a side effect. They might not have all the cheat codes you want right then and there until they release you know, like an update to their trainer periodically. For what I've noticed, for example, Kingdom Hearts, Kingdom Hearts 2, uh, 2 and 3 specifically on PC, most of the trainers I found, especially through Cheat Happens or Wii Mod only give you like infinite health and infinite magic and infinite focus stuff like that but there's nothing for like infinite form like for example Kingdom March 2 when you go into ultimate form you could stay in that form forever you can literally play from the game from start to finish and all the cutscenes and everything and all be in, in final form basically the entire time and never have to revert back to regular Sora so you got like a cheat like that and I could not find that cheat with the trainers I originally downloaded so but I did find it through Fling Trainer. It's called FlingTrainer.com. And I, f I finally found that through Google. And I found all the fucking cheats I wanted for Kingdom Hearts 2 and 3. So I basically got the all my trainers for, for spe the specific Kingdom Hearts games through FlingTrainer.com. Because it's like the only website that has the most cheats for the Kingdom Hearts games. Only a quarter of the cheats on the top left that you see is like available on the paid and the Wiimon stuff for Kingdom Hearts. But sometimes you'll also realize that sometimes certain cheats don't work and that's because also, like I said, it could be the trainer, so you have to find another trainer, or it could also be the fact that they just have not updated it yet and the game that you're running on is has been updated since then. So they have to remake that trainer for that game for it to work. Technically, how you activate a trainer in your games, you just make sure you have it running in the background. See, what cheat happens, you have to activate it. For their trainers, you keep it up, and then you just double-click on the game with your mouse and let it run, okay? You can have your controller plugged in if you're going to use a controller and stuff like that. Then you press the window key, bring up the desktop. If it doesn't bring up the desktop, okay, after you boot your game and the game's full screen and everything, right, and you press the window key, if that does not bring up the desktop, I know it's stupid, but sometimes you have to hold Control Alt and press Delete, and then click on Task Manager. I'm sure you figured out. You got to figure out a way to get to the desktop. Once you get to the desktop, then you can toggle these cheats, or while the game is running, you can just press the key on your keyboard as they're labeled here on the right hand side, like Numpad One, Two, Three, Four, and then whatever, forever, which one you want. You can also customize it. You know, change the keys on your keyboard to what you want them to activate too. So you technically don't have to back out of your game to go to the desktop to toggle them, but that's what I like to do. I like to back out, then I toggle them by clicking on the toggle. On it, I should be using the, the hotkeys, but I don't. <laughs> but with she happens specifically, whenever you boot up a game first, at the main menu, you gotta press F1 first. And then like an like a voice prompt says, Trainer activated! For example, like, or it says, or press F1 or click here. Trainer cannot find game. 
See, trainer cannot find. That's just because I'm not even running the fucking game right now. But once I run the game, then I press F1 at the main menu. Then I'll say trainer activated, and then that that's when I can actually toggle these on whenever I want. So the free ones, you don't usually have to activate anything. As soon as you boot up the game, just like I said, hit the window key or the control delete and task manager, just whatever. Find out a way to the desktop and then toggle them on whichever ones you want on as needed on whatever trainer you're using. Then go back to the game and you'll see they're activated. All right, see that zin zinny at the top? Watch this. Modifier, you put in the amount of money you want. Activated. 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 <laughs> Activated. What the frick is this negative? <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> what in the hell is that negative? Probably just a glitch and I... <laughs> okay, I'm gonna do that again. Hold on a second. <laughs> what the fuck? Activated. There we go. <laughs> that works. Look at my city. Oh, yeah. I'm rich as shit. to build your own computer. Find out what you're gonna be doing. Blah, 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 blah. Find out what you're gonna be doing on the computer. Then find a processor, aka your CPU, that's gonna give you those capabilities. Then find a motherboard that uses the same socket that the processor, aka your CPU, uses. Then find a CPU fan or CPU liquid cooler that also uses the same fucking socket your CPU uses. Everything else is plug and play. Your graphics card is gonna be plugged into a slot that's right directly below the processor. Then your RAM sticks is gonna be plugged into slots that are on the side or sides of your processor. And you refer to your motherboard manual, let you know what slots to plug your RAM sticks into, depending on how many you have, because you can't just plug in the RAM sticks to any slot you fucking want. And then your uh, CD and DVD or Blu-ray drives, your internal Blu-ray, CD, and DVD drives, and your hard drives or SSDs are all plugged in with two cables a piece. One cable powers them, the other cable allows the motherboard to read them. Common sense. And then your uh, tower that you get will already have cables inside them to allow your, your power button on your case and your tower to work and stuff like that. And those cords inside your tower will also plug into the motherboard. Everything else you screw down with screws and bolts and shit like that. That easy. You're done. All right, so we're gonna use a website called PCBarPicker.com to actually select all our computer parts. And you need to take this website with a grain of salt. The reason why I say take this website with a grain of salt is because it's usually wrong on two accounts. One, the RAM is usually wrong, and the wattage is usually wrong. I had a situation where I actually and solely relied on the compatibility structure of this website that it gives with the RAM and the compatibility of all the computer parts and shit like that. And I bought said RAM that showed was compatible with the motherboard that I selected and shit like that. And I plugged it in my motherboard, truck to my computer, turned on for two seconds. Did it shut right back off again? So then I shipped that RAM back, got my refund, and then what I actually did is I actually looked up the model number for my motherboard, because right on the box, it's also on the website with whatever motherboard you select, and I googled that, went to the motherboard manufacturer's website, that's right, and I believe it was an MSI board, I can't fucking remember, but here's an example, for example, this motherboard that I'm using right here in this build that I'm recording from right now is an MSI TRX40 Creator Edition, so all you gotta do is Google TRX40, you only have to fuck put MSI in the beginning of it, but you can if you want, anyways, you Google TRX40, right? Well, I'm gonna put TRX40 Creator because it's the exact exact fucking motherboard that I'm using. MSI.com, TRX Creator TX40. So I went to MSI.com, the actual motherboard's product page. And then what I did is I clicked on support at the top. Then I actually went over to compatibility left hand side. Then I actually selected based on the CPU that you are using. I'll get into this in the RAM section of the video when we get to that point. Clicked on memory. And as you see, you got all RAM that is 100% compatible with your motherboard. Why? Well, MSI themselves, aka your motherboard manufacturer, actually hires engineers, or maybe they do it themselves, I don't fucking know. But they get on there and they actually test hundreds of thousands of RAM sticks for their own motherboards before. Or they sell you their fucking motherboard. So that's what you need to rely on when it comes to selecting the RAM. Do not use PCPartPicker.com when selecting your 
RAM. You will most likely come into experience, like I just said. You'll probably select the RAM that this website says is compatible, and then you actually buy it. You put it in your computer, might turn on for two seconds to shut back off again. I'm just trying to save you a headache, trying to help you out. For those of you that might come across a situation where the motherboard manufacturer website does not have their own compatibility list, the, aka the RAM compatibility list for the motherboard that you select with this compatibility fucking website, supposedly, I can't help you. So, for example, ASRock, ASRock, whatever if I can call them, they do not, from what I can tell, from my experience, do not have their own RAM compatibility list for their motherboards. I don't know why. They're the only motherboard brand that I know does not have their own RAM compatibility list. MSI, Gigabit, or Gigabyte, whatever, Asus, everyone else that develops and manufactures motherboards has their own RAM compatibility list on their own website. But ASRock, or ASRock does not. So for those of you that select ASRock or ASRock or any other manufacturer, I don't fucking know, that creates motherboards that don't have the RAM compatibility list on their own websites, I can't help you. I'm sorry. Your only option for that is, I guess, to actually go on here and rely on their compatibility list. But I'm just saying, don't be surprised if you actually get the RAM that PC Part Picker says is compatible with your motherboard, and you put it on your motherboard, your computer turns off for like two seconds and shuts back off again, or it doesn't run properly. You have to ship that RAM back, then you got to select another RAM from the list that it shows. You got to do it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. It's just a waste of time. So I'm sorry. Sorry, but out of all the brands that I've ever bought motherboard wise, and we'll get into that later, but my most favorite brand that's never let me down, MSI. MSI third party graphics cards, MSI motherboards. Fantastic, fantabulous, spectacular, super amazing, and fucking fan. I already fuck said that. Fantastic, fantabulous. <sighs> Best brand I've ever had. Summarize, don't use this website. Rely on the RAM compatibility, and I'll explain on how to select your RAM properly. And don't rely on the fucking wattage. The wattage is going to be wrong. And I'll explain it <laughs> in detail why in the power supply selection section. So, we're going to go on system build on the top left hand side here. And this is, leads me to my next point of why I actually like to use this website. I mainly like to use this website for everything else compatibility wise, like I said, excluding RAM and wattage. I like to use it because it tells me if my motherboard is going to need a BIOS update to support a processor that I'm going to install into it. And we'll get into that later in the section of the video as well. We're going to be updating the BIOS before we even install windows we're gonna click on choose a cpu right here at the blue bar make sure that you select a cpu aka a processor that has been released in the last five years specifically if you want the fastest computer possible on the budget that you're working with if you're not sure if the cpu you're selecting has been released in the last five years you can google said processor the name of the processor and it will tell you when it's released put the name of the processor then put release date, okay? Okay. Okay, here's the thing. I asked you guys earlier a direct question in the beginning of this video. And it was really important. I even used a graph right here. Here's the thing. If you cannot answer this simple question, what are you going to be doing on the computer you're building? What are you going to be doing on the computer? If you cannot answer this simple fucking question and pick the processor with the amount of cores you're going to need based on this question, do not, I repeat, do not proceed with the rest of this video. I'm sorry, you are just, no offense, not smart enough to build your own computer. Period. End of story. Finn. <laughs> But if you can answer this question and you can select the amount of cores, which will tell you what type of processor you need, and you're able to choose from this graph right here that I've been showing this whole fuck time, then let's go ahead and proceed this video. Okay, so for all you basic bitches out there, those people that are just gonna be building the computer that schools use, hospitals use, social security office and food stamp office and fucking libraries use, those type of computers. You know, they just, they just allow you to do basic stuff like productivity apps, Microsoft Word, Microsoft PowerPoint, Microsoft Excel, database, maybe a little bit of Photoshop here and there, a little bit of graphic design. Nothing relating to 3D modeling and high graphical video games. And, and if you are gaming, you're gonna might do like Super Nintendo, regular Nintendo, Atari type graphics or Farmville, Popville, Pop It, <laughs> fucking Salter, Minesweeper, 3D Pinball, those were the days. Uh, any of those type of games, if you're gonna game on it, just, 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 just basic, non-intensive applications and programs on your computer. Then first of all, all you need is a dual core or a quad core. I still recommend a quad core over a dual core, because not only will it speed your computer up, considerably anyway, but eventually if you do ever decide that you change your mind, you want to high graphical PC game like Call of Duty, Battlefield, Mortal Kombat, Grand Theft Auto, and high graphical games like that just as examples, mind you. There's far better high graphical PC game examples than that, but you get a general idea. 
then you can always install a graphics card later on. But if you're just gonna do everything I just said. Basic stuff, like productivity apps, uh, Microsoft Word, Microsoft PowerPoint, Microsoft Excel, database, maybe a little bit of Photoshop here and there, a little bit of graphic design, but nothing relating to 3D modeling and high graphical video games. And, and if you are gaming, you're gonna might do like Super Nintendo, regular Nintendo, Atari type graphics, or Farmville, Popville, uh, Pop It, <laughs> fucking software, Minesweeper, 3D Pinball. All you need is a dual core quad core processor and you don't even need a graphics card at all because all dual core and quad core processors have integrated graphics. What that means is the processor itself has just enough graphical power to just give you a display. And in this regard, you would just plug in your monitor or TV directly into the motherboard. And the processor itself would just send the graphical signal from itself through the motherboard to the cable. Okay, now I'm talking directly to you high graphical PC gamers out there, your video encoders, video editors, video streamers, video enhancement, AI machine learning type people that's want to learn how to do all that crap, I guess. AMD or Intel? Well, it actually depends on what resolution you're going to be doing all those things with. If you're going to be high graphical gaming and video editing, video encoding, video streaming, and uh, video enhancing 1440p or 2K resolution or lower, then Intel will completely outshine AMD in every fucking area when it comes to performance and wait times and coding times and all that shit. It will slaughter. Intel will slaughter AMD when it comes to those resolutions. Now, why does resolution matter when it comes to these processors or when it comes to gaming videos? I'm sure you recognize this from any Windows fucking computer you ever use. Task Manager. That's right. Task Manager. Task Manager is useful because it shows you how much of the graphics card is being used and how much the processor is being used and even how much RAM is being used. Here's the thing. When you are gaming, high graphical gaming, at 1080p resolution or even video recording at 1080p resolution, Task Manager is going to show that your processor, aka your CPU, is being used like 90%. And your graphics card is only being used like 5-10%. All the work, your 1080p gaming and your 1080p recording is all mostly being done on the processor. And the graphics card ain't doing shit. Well, as you know, Intel has faster performance overall. All of their processors are faster than AMD, period. Well, mostly anyway. There are some like multi-core processors that AMD has that are faster than, than Intel, but mostly. As the 85, 90% of all Intel processors are faster and perform better than 85 to 90% of all AMD processors. And that's due to the single threaded performance that Intel usually has over the AMD processors, where AMD shines with multi-threaded performance better than Intel's multi-threaded. But nevertheless, my point is, is that since, since Intel has faster single thread performance and is usually faster non out of 10 most of the time over AMD, it's going to perform naturally better when it comes to 2K and 1440p or lower resolutions when it comes to high graphical gaming and video editing, video encoding, video streaming, and uh, video enhancing. Because all of the wars can be done on the processor overall anyway. But we are now in a world where well, 4K TVs are becoming cheaper, between $100, $300. I've seen great fucking deals with. Sony and Microsoft released an 8K fucking updates for the PS5 and Xbox Series X. These consoles like the very first consoles ever made in the history that supports 120 FPS with 4K resolution and stuff like that. 4K is becoming the norm and it's becoming more common. 4K resolution higher. If you're going to be doing that with your uh, PC, then it's not going to matter because all of your performance, your FPS and your encoding performance and the time it takes to do all your video editing and shit like that is all going to be determined by the graphics card and not the processor. Matter of fact, if you look at benchmark videos wherever you might see like certain game FPS benchmarks, they might do Intel versus AMD, but you use the same graphics card a benchmarks with 4K versus 4K. Different processors, one from AMD, one from Intel, but the same graphics card. And you'll notice that Intel always comes out with only one FPS more on average one. Oh my god guys i'm gonna spend two or three hundred dollars more on an intel processor that one fps is gonna make all the difference in the world man but i don't know what processor i'm getting i typed it in right here because well i don't know what processor i'm getting so we click on add here on the right hand side whenever you uh, get your uh, processor right now we're gonna move on to the next uh, section Okay, we're going to be skipping our CPU cooler, motherboard, memory storage, video card, aka graphics card, and go straight to the case, aka our tower. You know, all the computer parts we're going to be putting into, the big plastic box that has the power button on top or side or whatever to turn the computer on, and yeah. And the reason why is for, well, two reasons. One, you need to ask yourself, am I going to be getting a CPU liquid cooler, or am I going to be buying a CPU fan? 
CPU liquid coolers are only good for overclocking your processor. They're also useful for the longevity of your processor, you know, allowing your computer to last longer. I would say maybe two to four more years on average compared to if you just use a regular CPU fan. Just keep in mind, liquid CPU coolers take a little longer to install and might be a little bit more complicated to install than just a fucking CPU fan. See, with a CPU fan, all you got fucking have to do, put the processor on the motherboard, put thermal paste on it, then put the CPU fan on it, and on top of that, and then screw it down, you're done. A CPU liquid cooler on the other hand, <laughs> all of that, but prior to doing all that, you got to put all the fans screwed into the radiator slash filter that it comes with, and you gotta make sure that they're screwed in the right direction. <laughs> I learned that the hard way. You gotta actually put the part that's gonna go onto the processor itself, you gotta put that together. Then you also gotta make sure that it's completely even on both sides, and it's, it's just more complicated. But again, the uh, reward is greater because like I said, your computer and processor will last longer whether you're overclocking or not. So I like liquid CPU coolers no matter what, but that's just me. Now you can also liquid CPU cool your fucking graphics cards, but you don't use a CPU liquid cooler. You specifically look for a GPU liquid cooler. It'll look like a bracket. It'll look like it could actually connect to the top of the graphics card. The reason why I seen you ask this is because all towers are different. And there's actually two different types of towers. There's mid towers and full towers. I highly, highly recommend you get a full tower. Here's why. Full towers are better for heat dissipation and cable management. Them two alone should be extremely important to you. And the reason why is because, well, you'll soon find out if you go against my work and get a mid tower, but if you do get a mid tower, you'll soon find out that it's gonna be a really pain in the ass to actually fucking put your damn hand in there and your arm in there and to plug shit into the motherboard and to plug anything in for that matter because it's such a tight squeeze and a such a tight area to cram all your computer parts into and you're going to be using a fairly decent amount of wires mind you that's going to have a lot of heat and electricity travel through it's going to create even more heat throughout your case and since all the cables and all your computer parts are more crammed together in a mid tower it's a lot harder for the heat to escape the case to get away from your computer parts so they do not overheat and become damaged over time and performance of your games and video encoding and all that type of stuff does not degrade over time because of your computer components overheating and getting too hot. Now, unfortunately, Volt Towers, they cost usually around $100, $200 more than Mid Towers. But again, you get what you pay for in life. If you want your computer to last longer, you want your heat disk escape easier and become much easier for you to install all your computer parts into, then I highly, highly recommend get a Volt Tower. The reason why I bring up the, if you're going to be using a CPU liquid cooler or CPU fan is because of this picture right here. As you can see in the tower in the bedroom here, the uh, top of the tower has a small itty bitty square ventilation part. I'm only able to put a one fan liquid CPU cooler installed into. So for example, if we go back to Amazon, check this out. If we look up CPU liquid cooler, excuse me. Now we're gonna look, actually we're gonna look up Thermal Take. So that's the brand that I like and actually the one I'm gonna be using, 3.0 water is what it is. Oh, and why I put 30.0. Uh, here it is, 3.0 ARGB. Yep, that's the one I'm gonna be using in this video. And you'll notice that there's one 20 millimeter. That's the one fan I'm talking about. You'll have the two fan, there's another two fan here. And that depends on the size of your case also. And then you got three fans also. But for the case I just showed right here in the bedroom, the case at the top, and this is a mid tower, mind you, case in point, pun intended, <laughs> has a small square ventilation point. That is only useful for a one fan liquid CPU cooler. Example, if I try to install a two fan or a three fan into it, when the heat is trying to escape from the processor through the tubing, through the filter slash radiator, the fan's job is to try to blow the hot air out of the case. Well, if you install three fan to a case like I just showed in the bedroom, only one fan is going to be able to blow the hot air out because their two fans are going to be blocked by the top of the case. The rest of the case is solid. When you're looking up full towers and stuff like that, you'll notice that there's several different types. For example, a tower like this would be perfect for a three fan liquid CPU cooler because you can install the whole three fan at the top here. Here's the thing about the internal Blu-ray reader and writers. If you are planning on getting an internal Blu-ray reader and writer, then you need to get a tower like this. It has panels in the front. You'll pop one or two of these out and you'll open up the side panel here and then you'll actually, there's guardrails, what I like to call them. 
behind these panels, they'll actually slide the internal Blu-ray drive onto, and depending on the case, some cases have a lockdown mechanism that is spring-loaded, you just push back down, again, to lock the internal Blu-ray reader and writer into place, keeping it from moving on the inside, and in some cases require you to use a separate screw into a hole into the guard rail, aka bracket, and then directly into the internal Blu-ray reader and writer to keep the, to also hold it in place instead. However, because everything's digital nowadays, even with the Windows installation, in this video, I'm going to be showing you how to install Windows through a USB flash drive. Anyway, like again, it's up to you. So cool thing about desktop computers, everything is customizable, including your lights and all that cool shit. If you're not getting an internal Blu-ray reader and writer, then don't worry about getting a case like this. And keep in mind, you can always buy an external Blu-ray reader and writer that also burns CDs and DVDs as well later in the future and this is operated by USB so you just plug into a USB port on the outside of your <laughs> external blu-ray reader writer externally <laughs> from your uh, desktop computer just keep in mind the external blu-ray reader and writers CD and DVD writers and stuff like that are usually double the price if you haven't already could tell an internal blu-ray reader and writer is only like 60 70 bucks an external blu-ray reader and writer that's operated by USB that you can always add later, $120 and higher. You might think, well, aren't these for your hard drives? Aren't they considered hard drive bays? No. Your hard drive bays are actually on the bottom here for most cases that you buy, and they're just slots on the inside of the case you could just set your uh, hard drives and SSDs onto. And that also depends on how many SATA ports your motherboard has and stuff like that. Because, of course, well, if you have, like, six SATA ports, you can use six hard drives if you want. Or two Blu-ray reader and writers. I don't know why you'd want to use fucking two internal Blu-ray readers and writers, but <laughs> nevertheless, you can. <laughs> I guess if you want to, like, burn multiple discs at once. I don't even know what tower I'm getting. It's called a... It's, a, it's actually from Thermaltake. I love Thermaltake brand. My favorite brand is really not computer-wise. If you guys want to know, is Thermaltake and MSI. Neither brand has ever let me down. They are fucking awesome full tower thermal take snow i don't know exactly what it's called but the one i got was a snow and it's view so i think it's a 71 there it is bam there it is it throws like view 71 snow that's what it is this case is beautiful guys it is gorgeous the only fucking problem with it is it's extremely extremely heavy <laughs> well i wonder why it's actual glass all these sides are actual glass so make sure if you get a tower like this do not put it like under something like under a shelf where like there's heavy stuff or just anything really that might fall off a shelf and land right on your on the tower it will shatter it, actual glass you know actual windows in your house that type of glass yeah that's what this type of glass is now a cool thing about this though is that these little black knobs you actually come out and you actually take the whole you can take the whole panel off the whole thing it, nevertheless there is glass on the left side right side front and top there's no glass on the bottom or the back of this tower. And now you see that's the top of the case right there. So it has like a, we're not actually has a magnetic flimsy uh, filter thing at the top. You could take that out if you want. It's up to you. It's actually difficult to keep it mag magnetized after you install a liquid CPU cooler. But as you can see, you know, the whole top portion is completely open. You can see there's, there's like a lot of slots on the inside. And those slots are useful for actually screwing in a liquid CPU cooler. So for this case... A liquid cooler like I showed earlier, the thermal take, three fan one would be perfect for this tower. And now we know what CPU liquid cooler we're going to get. Look how easy that was. <laughs> And since, so, and since everything's digital, we're not going to be in, installing Windows through a disk, and we're not going to care about burning disks or really any any of that type of shit, whatever. I'm I'm not going to care about getting a tower that has a drive base, and I'm also certainly not going to fucking care about getting an internal Blu-ray reader and writer. So again, this tower's perfect for my needs. Look at that! Kill two birds with one stone. Now make sure that whether you get a CPU fan or a CPU liquid cooler, that it uses the exact same socket as your processor. So for example, on PCParkBreaker.com, you can click on the processor that you selected, and then you click on it, go to back, back to the page, scroll down, and then the left-hand side under specifications, you'll see under socket, socket AM4. So all you have to do from there is actually look up CPU fan AM4 socket. CPU fan AM4 socket. Same thing with liquid cooler. Look up CPU liquid cooler AM4 socket. And if it doesn't say it in the title, the label, make sure to click on it and then read about it. 
under the about this item or maybe scroll down more and make sure AM4 socket is listed. It includes high end thermal paste. That's good because you're going to need thermal paste obviously. So it comes with thermal paste and this can be used on an Intel processor. The Intel processor sockets LJ1700, LJ1200, LJ1150, LJ so on and so forth. And it can also be used on AMD processors on their sockets. And right there AMD M4. Bam. So you can buy this one and use it for this processor for the video if you want to. There's also other ones that are bigger in size. And this is why I say you might as well just get a full tower because it's just better for heat dissipation, cable management, and space. Because you might come across a situation where you might get a big chunky CPU fan. You try to close the uh, side panel of your tower and you can't fucking close it. <laughs> yeah, trust me. I had a situation like that before. Odd. Very odd, very awkward, very embarrassing. Also, there's two actually two different types of fans you can actually get, especially for the AM4 socket. You get an AM4 CPU fan that has its own screws, or you can get an AM4 socket CPU fan that has buckles. And the reason why some have buckles, some have screws, is because, depending on the motherboard you get, some motherboards have black plastic brackets that are screwed in that have pretty much hooks on them. One on the top of the processor socket, and another on the bottom of the processor socket. You can buy this CPU fan if you want, and all you gotta do is after applying thermal paste to your processor, then you'll put this just directly on top of the processor, and these buckles just hook in to those brackets. You're done. Takes less than 10, 20 seconds to install. Or, if you don't wanna do that, you wanna go the extra mile, I guess. I don't know why, why you would, but you could. You can buy this one, an AM4 socket one that has screws in it. Now for these fans, you actually have to manually take a screwdriver and actually unscrew the black plastic uh, bars or brackets that I'm talking about. Take them out, including the screws. Because since these have their own screws, you have to screw these down into those holes instead. Keep in mind there's like three different types of CPU fans, technically. Two regular types of CPU fans and one type of liquid, well actually two of it liquid cores if you want to do a custom liquid cooling solution, but we're not getting into that fucking bullshit because that's just more money and that's, that requires a lot more time to set up. I, I, just, I just find it easier just to buy an all-in-one liquid cooler already uh, made and just it's just much easier to install. All right, now we're going to be choosing our motherboard next. So click on choose a motherboard. And obviously the compatibility filter is already on. Even though, as I keep mentioning and I can't stress enough, that the compatibility filter is usually wrong with the RAM compatibility and the wattage compatibility. And I'll get to that later when we reach those sections of the video. However, since the compatibility filter is on, it already has the AM4 socket that supports our AM4 socket CPU already selected. So all the motherboards that have AM4 socket. I highly, highly, highly recommend you get an ATX, a regular ATX motherboard. Stay the hell away from micro ATX boards and mini ITX boards. I don't care how great the reviews are, I don't care how cheap they are, I don't give four fucks, three shits, or two rats asses about any of that. Stay the hell away from them. Why? I had an experience where I actually bought a micro ATX board one time, and I do a lot of video AI enhancement work, as you can see right here from Topaz Labs, okay? Now this program can range from anywhere from two hours to five days to AI enhance one video. That's right, five days for one video, depending on the resolution. Now why am I bringing this up? Well, there was a situation where I actually allowed my video enhancement software here to run for five days straight and the video was almost done processing. Then what ended up happening is that the display of the computer just stopped working. The computer would still be on, but the display just stopped working. Now you might be thinking, oh, we sh you should be moving the mouse, maybe hit some keys and bring the display back up. I'm not stupid. I did that. I changed some shit in the registry. I looked everything 
up on Google how to fix this problem. Some said it could be the power supply going bad, could have been the graphics card port going bad, it could be the monitor going bad, oh switch out the cords, oh switch out you know the HDMI and the display port cords, oh unplug the power from the monitor completely, the Plug it back in, and that does help display issues sometimes. Oh, yeah, and there's also a Windows setting you can go into via your power options called USB Selective Suspend to disable that, and I did that too. I even went as far as to reinstall Windows. That was fun. Every solution I can come across all on the internet to fix this one problem, and nothing worked. So guess what I did? I took that micro ATX board I had, and I fucking chucked that bitch. I threw it on the ground out of anger, and then I just... Threw that damn thing away. Piece of shit motherboard that I'm not gonna use no more. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. No. 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 Hell no. It was a piece of shit. Then guess what I did? I bought a regular ATX board. No problems. No display problems. The AI enhancement work was great. Worked fantastically. I will never, ever, ever buy a micro ATX or a mini ITX motherboard ever again for the rest of my life. Period. End of story. And besides, if you ever want to install like video capture cards like Elgato 4K60 or Aver Media Live 4K Gamer or their 8K capture cards and you want to like plug your PS5 and Xbox Series X or future consoles into these type of capture cards to record 8K footage from your consoles, then you're going to need a video capture card that plugs directly under your graphics card inside the motherboard. It's the slot right below the graphics card. If you get a micro ATX or mini ITX board, graphics cards are becoming so thick that it's going to block that bottom port. So you're not going to be able to plug in anything except a graphics card below the processor. Okay. So keep that in mind as well. So your best bet is just get an ATX board. It's they're more they're more powerful. They have more bandwidth. They have more features. They're just better. Period. Overall, you know, I had a buddy ask me the other day, "Hey man, do you have a motherboard that has a USB Type C port?" Now, for those who don't know what USB Type C ports, what a lot of smartphones use nowadays, like the Galaxy Notes and stuff like that. It's not a regular, you know, mini USB. It's more circular in form. Here's the thing, though. When you select your motherboard, you do not have to have certain ports. You can always add to your motherboards via adapters or what's called expansion cards. For example, if you get a motherboard and it has no USB Type-C port, you can buy adapters to convert a regular USB port into a USB Type-C port or vice versa, I'm sure. It might not be as fast as if it was USB Type-C to USB Type-C, but it could still get you by. Or for example, like maybe your motherboard you get don't have enough USB ports. You can buy USB hubs is what they're called. Like one USB cord and then it turns into like this little box that has like eight to 10 USB ports. You can add USB USB ports via like another cord and cable and stuff. But like I said, just keep that in mind. Some ports that your motherboard does not have, you can add via adapters. But this is the motherboard that we're going to be using in this video. I already bought it, obviously, ahead of time. And as you can see on the all the way here, sorry for the camera, weird thing. Well, anyways, it says AMD Ryzen 2000, 3000, and 5000 series compatible which is exactly the processor we're using, 5950X, 5000 series, Ryzen 5000 series. So, X570S Edge Max, right there, it's already typed in. There's our motherboard that we're gonna be getting, and it's ATX, like I want. Before we actually add it, I wanna click on it, and I wanna go over a few things here. Even though all motherboards are different, most of the features that these motherboards have are more or less the same. So I'm gonna scroll down here, I'm gonna go over everything on the left-hand side here on what all of this means. I'm gonna try to summarize it as fast and quick as I possibly can so we can hurry up and move on to the next computer part. All right, so here's the thing. Obviously, manufacturer is the maker, aka the manufacturer of the motherboard. This motherboard is made and manufactured and created by MSI. Part numbers or model number. Socket is obviously the socket the CPU, aka our processor uses, just like I mentioned several times in this video. You know, you find the processor is going to give you the capabilities you want to do on the computer, then that processor is going to tell you what socket it uses and it needs. Then you find a CPU fan or CPU liquid cooler that uses the exact same socket. Then you find our motherboard that uses the same fucking socket the CPU uses. And that's how you know all three of those parts 
motherboard, CPU, and your CPU fan or CPU liquid cooler is all compatible with each other and you're golden. Form factor you already know about, obviously, chipset doesn't fucking matter. Memory max is basically the maximum amount of RAM you can install on your computer. So, for example, there's four memory slots in this motherboard, meaning you can put four RAM sticks into it at max. So, if you want, I don't know why you would, but if you want 128 gigabyte of RAM, then you would have to install and buy four 32 gigabyte RAM sticks. It's basic math. 128 RAM max divided by the amount of RAM slots. They're also called DIMM slots, D-I-M-M -M slots. So 128 max divided by the amount of slots you have and 32. So you'd have to have four 32 gigabyte RAM sticks. Uh, this could give you an idea how much you cost possibly need, but I'm gonna be showing you how much you might possibly need when we get to the RAM section of this video anyway. So here's an example, task manager. So I am running a, obviously my editing, video editing program, Google Chrome, obviously reading off of. I'm not actually mining with my Bitcoin cryptocurrency miner, but it is still running in the background. It's just idle. I also am, well, it's kind of like pre-recording. It's considered instant replay. I'm not actually recording, but what it's doing is it's saving to my RAM as I'm I guess recording, that fucking makes sense. And then when it's actually officially done, it'll transfer from the RAM straight to the hard drive. And I am technically recording at 4K 60 FPS. So I'm doing all of this. You know, running a video editing program, Chrome, an idle Bitcoin miner that's not mining right now. And there's several other stuff that's running just idle as well. You know, I'm recording at 4K 60 FPS all at the exact same time. And I'm literally only using about 21% of the 64 gigabytes of RAM that I have in this computer. So if we go to performance, it says right there memory. I'm only using 14 gigabyte of RAM doing all of that. So, now of course, once you boot up an actual PC game, your RAM's gonna skyrocket. PC games alone, usually, especially modern PC games, usually require at least 16 gigabyte of RAM minimum to even boot. Like I said, I'll get more of that requirement, I guess RAM requirements and what you possibly need when you get the RAM section. But then obviously your memory type, there's DDR3, DDR4, and there's other types, I'm sure. And memory speed on the left-hand side here, that's usually 2400 and higher is good. Anything less than that is trash. I wouldn't even bother. All right, color is the basic color on the board, which no one fucking gives a shit about. Then you got SLL Crossfire Cable, which is basically the same thing. It just allows you to use more than one graphics card, like 210 ATIs, 220 ATIs, or 230, stuff like that. You don't have to buy an adapter, a three-slot, a four-slot adapter. I forget what the fucking adapter is called. But then you'll actually use this adapter, depending on how far apart both graphics cards are on the motherboard. And then you'll fucking connect both of them with set adapters like that. And you are you know, can play even higher resolution or even higher frame rates with that. Most people can't afford more than one graphics card, let alone one graphics card. And also with technology today graphics cards are becoming more and more and more, more powerful you got 4k 120 fps support full 8k 60 fps support and stuff like that so even needing more than one graphics card is literally a waste of time and money and effort not to mention not many pc games support SLI Crossfire to begin with. Honestly, I feel like the only fucking reason why you would even need SLI Crossfire is for one, if you had the fucking money to blow, <laughs> which is thousands upon thousands of dollars. And then two, if you're like cryptocurrency Bitcoin mining, you need the extra fucking graphical power and stuff like that. Or maybe you are developing your own video game, you need the extra graphical memory. But in that regard, I don't know why you wouldn't just buy like an NVIDIA Quadro that has the extra graphical memory. And I'll get into graphical memory later in the graphical card section of the video. Then you got PCI Express times 16 times 8 times 4 and times 1 slots, which are basically slots you're going to be plugging your graphics cards and your video capture devices into like an Algo to 4K 60 or an Avery Media Live 4K game or like you want to plug your PS5 or Xbox Series X HDMI cord straight into so you can actually record 4K resolution videos from the consoles directly to your computer and stuff like that. Keep in mind those devices will only most likely only use the times 4 times 8. And the cool thing about these times 16 times 8 times 4 times 1 slots is the fact that they're all backwards compatible. So for example if you let's just say you have nothing but PCI times 16 slots that's okay. You can actually plug in your Algo to or fucking Avery Media in the times 16 slot and the computer will automatically only allow the times 16 speed slot to send your video capture card times 8 or times 4 speed only because that's the maximum that the video capture card obviously supports. So, yeah. So, don't worry about that. Also, the times 16 slot is technically the only slots that will be used for your graphics card because imagine that your graphics card is technically the most powerful computer component in the whole fucking build. I think I got M.2 slots, which is basically a newer form factor. Older motherboards do not have this, but what M.2 slots are mainly for is for like NVMe M.2 SSDs. You got, and I'll get into more specifics with SSDs later in the SSD and hard drive section of this video, but I will tell you that, you know, there's SSDs where we have the SATA cable go from the motherboard port straight into SSD. Then you got actual NVMe M.2 SSDs that are for within microchip hard drives. It's fucking crazy. Then you plug it into a little slot here, you push it down by spring mechanism or whatever, and then you screw it down, done, and the computer detects it as another SSD. Then you got mini PCI Express slots and micro SATA slots. I'm not fucking getting a lot of shit. SATA is basically your uh, speed of the SATA ports. Your onboard Ethernet is the speed of your 
internet. So, for example, you can do, like, I'm sure you're aware of, you know, you got gigabit internet speeds. Well, believe it or not, there's actually multi-gig internet speeds from your ISP, aka your internet service provider. You can fucking pay for 10 gigabit per second internet speed if you want. It's mostly for businesses, but multi-gig internet packages, they do exist. You know, you'll be spending three or four fucking hard hours a month, but they do exist. <laughs> and this just lets you know, like, say if you pay for 10 for a business plan, this mother will only support a quarter of that. Uh, then you got onboard video, depends on CPU. I mentioned this in the processor section, but dual core and quad core processors are the only processors that usually have integrated graphics, which is only powerful enough to give you a display, aka a picture for you to do productivity apps like that, maybe even 2D games and web-based games, stuff like that, if you do game, okay? So this is like, you know, hey, it depends on the CPU. If you get a dual core or quad core processor, then, yeah, you'll have video. What you'll do is you'll plug the HDMI port directly into the motherboard itself, and the processor will send the signal through the motherboard to the HDMI port directly to your display. If you get an octa-core CPU or higher, or if you have a graphics card at all, you'll have to plug in the HDMI cord directly into the graphics card instead. If you have an 8-core processor or more, then you'll have to get a separate graphics card anyway. So this is why it says depends on the CPU. Then you got USB 2.0 headers, 3.2, and Gen 1 and Gen 2, all that fucking just a higher speed USB ports like that. Keep in mind, these are not to be confused with ports. Headers are not the same thing as ports. Each header has multiple USB ports. They can have anywhere from two to four USB ports each. So when it says USB 2.0 headers, only two, it actually means there's actually four to eight USB ports with USB 2.0 speed. Or same thing here, 3.2 Gen 1 speed, so forth and so on. Now, supports ECC. This is not really important for most people. ECC is only useful for like people with servers and fucking, you know, hosting internet packages for consumers or, you know, just, just other types of business needs that most video editors and game developers and, you know, video professionals, even streamers do not require. What it just means is it just stands for error correction code or error code, what the fuck ever, okay? It just means only for the RAM. It only has to do with the RAM. For example, if you save stuff into the RAM temporarily, permanently, whatever, then if, let's just say a crash happens, your mainframe completely crashed, everything that's saved temporarily or permanently to the RAM is completely lost and it's corrupted if it does not have ECC. The reason why I say this does not matter for most people watching this video, gamers, video streamers, video recorders, and all that shit is because, for example, what I'm doing right now, I'm actually recording through my RAM and graphics card at the exact same time. It's not, it's, it's kind of like a pre-recording, okay? It's called instant replay feature. So, for example, I can leave instant replay on, and then I can save what I did the past 20 minutes ago, okay? So, that's what's, what's, it's like a pre-recording feature. Then you got regular recording. Now, the difference between the two is that with instant replay, it just saves frames to the RAM as it's pre-recording. Then whenever I finally want to save what I already, you know, what was doing, then I can hit a certain key and then it will automatically save directly to the hard drive. Let's just say I'm uh, pre-recording right now with this instant replay feature. My computer just fucking completely shuts fucking off. I would have to start all over and redo this entire segment that I've been doing. The whole thing. Whereas if I was recording, straight recording, the graphics card would just be saving the video directly to the hard drive as I'm recording. See the difference? Now if the computer crashes doing that, the video file, even though it's not completely finished, the video file will still be saved to the hard drive. So I'll still have some of the video recorded, it just wasn't finished. Now if my RAM had ECC, and it was still pre-recording and my computer crashes, then that pre-recording would still be saved somewhere in the RAM, even though the computer crashed. That is basically what ECC would do. It would still allow you to restore whatever was saved in the RAM prior to a crash. You know, most consumers, the editors, you know, video gamers and stuff like that all save their work directly to the hard drive. So most video editors, video professionals, and gamers don't save stuff to the RAM. The RAM only helps with the speeds, like FPS speeds and video encoding speeds and stuff like that. So that's the best way to describe what basically ECC does. So it's technically useless for most consumers, including gamers and streamers and video editors. Wireless networking, Wi-Fi, that's just the strength of Wi-Fi. Yes, you can turn desktops into wireless. Who fucking needs laptops anymore? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I get it. Laptops are for your lap. You can't really fucking put a big ass fucking chunky desktop on your lap. <laughs> I, I get the appeal, but you know what I'm saying? RAID support, RAID support is literally basically tricking the computer into thinking that you have one hard drive when you actually have multiple. So for example, if I want to connect two 8 terabyte SSDs. It's extremely expensive, but it's just an example. I can put them into RAID through the BIOS, through like configuration files and shit, and then I can turn both 8 terabyte SSDs into one 16 terabyte SSD. So even though it's physically two hard drives, two SSDs, the computer thinks it's only one. 
That's basically what Raid support is. It's like fucking Dragon Ball Z. You know, you got uh, the fusion, Goku and Vegeta. You got two of almost the same power levels. They fuse together to become one more powerful being with both their power levels combined. And it's, it's the same fucking concept. Two 8 terabyte SSDs fused together. And the computer thinks it's only one fucking big, massive, you know, 16, you know, 8 plus 8, 8 terabyte plus 8 terabyte. One 16 fucking terabyte SSD when it's actually two drives. All right, so as I already mentioned, I already know what motherboard I'm getting. The X57S Edge Max Wi-Fi. Regular ATX motherboard. Manufactured by MSI. So that's manufacturer. And... As I mentioned earlier, this website can show sometimes, they'll say right here, compatibility warning. These parts have potential issues or incompatibilities. See details below. So if you click on details, it'll show you right here. Some AMD X570 chipset motherboards may need to BIOS update priority using Vermeer CPUs. Upgrading the BIOS may require a different CPU that's supported by older BIOS revisions. You might be thinking, oh crap, so. Oh no, that means I'm going to have to buy an older CPU to put in the motherboard, then update the BIOS, then take the older CPU out of the motherboard, take the computer part again to do that, then put the new processor in just so I could use the motherboard. Okay, look, I never had a situation where I ever had to do that. Technically, this just means that you need to upgrade the BIOS before using the newer CPU that you're installing into the motherboard, before, like, operating systems can use the processor to its full potential. We're going to be upgrading the BIOS before we even install Windows anyways. So, don't worry about that. We can go ahead and install the newest CPU into this motherboard first, and it will still turn on and still boot up into the BIOS. Once we get in the BIOS, we're going to be updating the BIOS directly. Then we will install Windows from there later in this video. Either way, we're good on the motherboard. All right, now we're going to be selecting our RAM, but we're going to get it directly from the motherboard manufacturer's website with their compatibility list and I'll show that in a minute. We're gonna go ahead and click on choose memory here, the little blue bar. We're just gonna leave it at this page until I explain a few things first. We're not gonna select anything from this page from this website right now. So hold your horses. So for all you basic bitches out there, the people that just want to know how much gigabyte of RAM you need for basic things, as I mentioned plenty of times in this video, Office application, Microsoft Word, Database, PowerPoint, Excel, maybe if you do game, it'd be only like 2D games, like Nintendo, Super Nintendo, and web-based games like Pop It, Farmville, and Popville, and stuff like that. The maximum amount of RAM that you people need is probably only eight. Literally just eight gigabytes of RAM. We'll give you plenty of leg room for anything else. I highly doubt you're even going to touch half of that though for most of the stuff you're going to be doing. Now I'm talking directly to all you PC gamers out there, you game streamers and streamers in general and video editors and recorders and all of that type of stuff. You guys minimum need double that. You at least need 16 GB. 16 gigabyte of RAM because as soon as you boot up a game any high graphical game your RAM's going to jump from like 2 gigs all the way like to 10 to 12 instantly you're going to need extra RAM in case you want to record stream and stuff like that as well now if you can get more than 16 at least get 32 or 64, you'll be golden. But for those of you that are just building their computer, 16 minimum. All right, remember what I told you. Do not use PCPartPicker.com when getting your RAM. What we're going to do is we're going to actually Google and look up our motherboard name. Right here, MSI. You don't have to put the whole thing. What I usually do is I'm just going to put the model number, so X570S Edge Max. Google should already tell us it is already manufactured by MSI. So let's do this. X570S Edge Max, right there, right there, MSI.com. Make sure it is the manufacturer of the motherboard. So we're going to click on the product that goes straight to the product page on the manufacturer's website. So MSI.com, we're going to click on the actual motherboard we have, and yes, that is it. And we're going to click on support at the top here. We're going to scroll down, we're going to click on compatibility on the left-hand side. Then you'll notice all this extra crap. Okay, this depends on the processor, aka your CPU that you have. Since there's different CPUs, there's also different code names, what they're called. So, for example, this one says Cezanne, this one's Vermeer, Renau, or whatever, Matisse, Picasso, Pinnacle Ridge. If you don't know what your CPU code name is, 
Google it. Google is your friend. The processor we have is a Ryzen 9 5950X. All you have to put in Google is Ryzen 9 5950X. Code name. There it is. Vermeer. Series AMD Vermeer. Code name Vermeer Zen 3. PC Power Picker, I believe, also has it. If you click on the CPU itself and then scroll down the left hand side, it should have on the left hand side over here as well. Core family Vermeer Bam. I'm just saying, just in case. You can Google. Yeah, we know it's the Vermeer. So we're going to find the Vermeer. It's right here. Memory by RX-5XSX. Now keep in mind, all websites are laid out differently. How I got to the RAM compatibility list here, as I just showed, can be completely different for other motherboards. So, for example, I'm going to bring up a Gigabyte board that I used to have. And it's a Gigabyte, yeah, B550M DS3HAC. This is actually the motherboard I threw on the ground earlier that I showed in a video clip. Piece of shit, the board that I'm not gonna use no more. This one is a micro ATX board. The, you know, the motherboards I'm gonna fuck stay away from now <laughs> that I mentioned in the motherboard section of the video. So on gigabyte.com, go directly to the actual model. And then what you'll do is you'll click on support at the top, just like MSI's website. But then instead of compatibility on the left-hand side, you're gonna click on support list. See how it's laid out differently? But I'm sure you're small enough to navigate a website. But you'll click on support list and then it'll be under right there for your uh, code name of your CPU. And then you'll click on download. And then of course, it'll show a whole fucking list. I could turn dark mode off or whatever. So there you go, it looks proper. But you can hold control on your keyboard and press plus or the equal uh, key and then you minus whatever to zoom in and out or whatever as you're holding control. Yeah, and it shows you then all the RAM that's 100% compatible with that motherboard. But we're not using Gigabit, we're using MSI's motherboard. So like I said, I already clicked on Vermeer for my CPU, the code name of my CPU. And as you can see here, here's all the brands of RAM and the model numbers for said RAM. Now, why is this important? Check this shit out. So if you want the best of the best, you're going to pay for it, obviously. The faster it is, the more expensive it is, and the more size it is, the more expensive it can be. So what I like to do is I like to click on supported speed. Don't do SPD speed, RAM speed, but use supported speed. Again, every motherboard manufacturer's website is laid out different, but try to find the highest speed and try to find those. So click on support of speed. We're gonna click on again to get the highest number. This lets us know that, look, this RAM right here can run at 5100 megahertz. It's sold as 5133, but it will run at default at 2400. That's right. So when you look at motherboard boxes, it'll even tell you what, what RAM speeds your motherboard will support. But here's the problem with this. It just says DDR4 5300, then it says plus, and then it says OC in parentheses. So what this means is overclock. So you cannot just buy a 5100 megahertz RAM and then just slap it in your computer and then expect it to run at that speed. You have to actually buy the RAM that's on the list and you'll have to overclock the RAM to get the highest speed. So for those of you that don't know how to operate a computer, if you want to know what your RAM is running at, all you have to do is actually look up what's called CMD, type it in and run as administrator. Make sure run as administrator. And then what you'll do is you'll type in WMIC space memory chip, all one word memory chip, space get space and then speed. Hit enter and then that tells you what speed every RAM stick you have in your computer is running at. You can also get this in the BIOS as well. Whenever you boot up your computer, it'll let you know what speed your RAM is running at. And if it's not running at the speed that you bought, all you have to do is nowadays, newer motherboards have what's called XMP. You just enable that. It's usually profile one or two. Nine times out of 10, it's usually profile one. You'll just turn that on and then restart your computer and then your RAM should be overclocked to the highest speed. But nevertheless, this is how you would actually find your RAM. You don't just type it Kingston in. What you'll do is actually copy and paste the model in. So highlight the whole model number here, right click and then copy. 
Go to Amazon or eBay. It's the only two websites I usually use to buy my computer parts app. <laughs> you can use Newegg or I think Tiger Direct and other websites you can computer parts on, but the main ones that I use only Amazon and eBay. Then you'll just paste it. So again, you highlight whatever model that you're wanting to look up that you are thinking about purchasing. Highlight the model number and then copy it and then paste it into Amazon or eBay to actually look for it and bam, there it is. Make sure that the model number is exactly, exactly the same from the list. If you're not sure, you can also hold control and press F on the page when you're on a store page and paste it into there and then make sure that, yeah, the whole thing is completely the same. Now, you might come across a situation where a RAM you might have or might buy is only one alphanumerical character off. So, for example, you know, the RAM compatibility list from the motherboard manufacturer's website for your motherboard might show that, you know, the one that's supported is KF451C5. 0RBK2. But the one you can only find is KF451C2 0RBK2. You can still go ahead and pull the trigger and buy that RAM because chances are it's the exact same RAM. It's just a different revision, meaning the 5 one could be newer or could just be an older model of this exact same RAM and the motherboard will still detect it and use it properly. Now, if you're running into problems, just like I said earlier, and you put the RAM in the computer and your computer turns on for like one or two seconds and shuts back off again, that's usually a primary indicator of the RAM not being compatible. Just go ahead and take the RAM out and ship it back and get another one off the list and again, try to get as close to the exact same model number from the RAM compatibility list of your motherboard manufacturer's website on their product page themselves as possible. PNY down here is the one that I end up getting. So it's like the second, second or third best speed. Still pretty damn good. And see what I mean by you can't rely on PCPartPicker.com when selecting your RAM too? It doesn't even have my 4400 megahertz PNY brand RAM that I'm about to buy. It doesn't even have it at all. I'm, I'm just gonna have to select the 3200 one, I guess. It's, it's whatever. <laughs> now since we have our RAM, we're going to actually get our storage. All right, so here's the thing. I am not going to help you on determining how much gigabyte or how many terabytes you need for a hard drive or a solid state drive. You're going to have to figure that out yourself. If you're going to be smart enough to build a computer, you're going to have to figure this out yourself because, well, with technology, you know, your phones and, you know, consoles where you download and save a lot of games to and stuff like that. I'm sure you're smart enough to figure out how much space you need. Just understand that the more space that you buy for a hard drive, the more expensive it is. And the faster the hard drive is, the more expensive it is. So for example, an eight terabyte solid state drive can run you up to almost over a thousand fucking dollars. Whereas an eight terabyte regular hard drive would only cost you like two, 300 bucks a quarter of the price. And it's because you're paying for the speed of the solid state drive. There's a CD, which is a hard disk drive. That is the original hard drive that started all that we all used to have in our computers. Then you actually have SSDs, which is the fastest of all hard drives in existence. And they stand for solid state drive. Then, believe it or not, you have a mixture between the two called an SSHD. It's called a solid state hybrid drive. These drives have a mixture of both parts, the regular hard drive parts and a the newer solid state drive parts with its flash memory. And that just helps with cost. It's not as fast as a regular SSD, but it's also not as slow as a regular HDD, but has the space of a regular HDD. So it's a balance between the two. So an SSHD is an option for a lot of you. Then you have what's called NVMe SSDs or M.2, basically the same fucking thing. The only difference between these two and VME SSDs have faster read and write speeds, damn near 10 times the read and write speeds as a regular SSD, okay? But I'll go into that more in detail in a minute. I wanna to explain to you why SSDs are way better than regular hard drives nowadays. I'm sure you probably talked to your family members before and like whenever you turn on a computer, you ever hear that sound that goes 
You know, one of your family members will be like, oh, that's just the computer turn on. No, that is the hard drive kicking on. The regular old original hard drive kicking on. It's this needle moving. And the sound is these platters spinning. So spins and then you go that is the needle right here moving back and forth up front really fast if you've ever actually used a computer before you might notice where for example let's just say i'm like in videos here and i want to double click on it right you know sometimes back in the day when you double click on a video it could take up to one to two minutes before the video even fucking pops on the reason why it stalls and takes a minute for it to pop up to actually show you is the fact that the video file and all your files is stored on a platter and this platter has to spin to to the needle for the needle to read or write to or from it so for example just to, just to visualize a video file could be right here at the top of the platter right and when you double click on it within windows what will happen is that you have to wait on the platter of the hard drive to spin around to the bottom and then also wait on the needle to go back and forth to read it then after it reads it that's when the video will finally pop up and start Plain. And that's how regular hard drives used to work. But now we have SSDs. Enter SSDs. SSDs are just like our phones. You know, as soon as you tap on anything, it's instant. So this, like right here, is the power instant. As soon as you click on something, bam, it's up. Bring it up, bam, done, bam. That's usually how fast it is with everything on my computer. Everything. Everything I access. And that is the power of SSD. All right, now I'm actually going to go over why NVMe M.2 SSDs might be a waste of money to a lot of you compared to regular SSDs. And the reason why I bring this up is because you might be thinking, oh, well, if an NVMe SSD has like 10 times the read and write speed of a regular SSD, then my games should load faster and everything in my PC games in general should be faster while I'm playing them compared to a regular SSD. Wrong. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. No, 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 hell no. NVMe M.2 SSDs will only help people that deal with like video framework. For example, when you're like dealing with, as you can see right here in this little Cage 3 PC Tangled Outputted Frames original folder I have here, as you can see, I have over 95,567 frames. This is a 45 to 50 minute video right here. Consists of 95,567 frames you know, 30 frames per second, 60 frames per second. Frames make videos. When there's thousands of pictures played in sequence, aka frames, that's how a video is created. When you convert a video into individual frames, you have this type of shit. Why do I need to do stuff like this? This is useful for being able to do AI enhancement work per frame with Programs like Topaz Sharpen AI or Topaz Gigapixel. Certain picture AI enhancement programs that will enhance the individual frames for me before I can put it right back into video format. So my point is, when you're dealing with thousands to tens of thousands, whatever, of frames for videos or hundreds of thousands of MP3s like songs or hundreds of thousands of fucking videos per folder and you have to copy and paste them from folder to another folder or from one computer to a fucking USB, you know, storage device, USB external drive, or from one computer to another computer. This is where NVMe M.2 SSDs would shine over a regular SSD, because as you can see right here, I actually recorded this on my other computer because I'm using two different computers to showcase all these video clips. And you see here, whenever I am trying to copy and paste something, it'll show, look, you know, the mouse stalls. Even when you are trying to copy more than 30,000 pictures, the computer freezes for a minute. And you have to fucking wait, like, between 30 seconds to a minute before you're even able to copy anything. So in this regard, I would need an NVMe M.2 so the computer won't stall when I'm doing stuff like that. But as you can also see right here, I'm copying, as you can see, almost 10,000 frames. 
and this is just an ex as an example as you can see it's running doing at a speed of over 300 megabyte a second and as you can also clearly see you could probably say it's going to take anywhere for right there three about three minutes if all of this was on an NVMe M.2 SSD, then this speed would not be over 300 or 200 megabyte a second. It would be over two or 3,000 megabyte a second. Instead of copying 10,000 frames from one folder to another and it taking three minutes, it would take probably less than 10 seconds. And that's where an NVMe M.2 SSD would shine as well. Again, if you guys are thinking about getting an NVMe M.2 SSD, just know that the only use for it is it can read and write a fuck ton of files at once from one folder to another or from one computer to another or from one computer to another like USB external drive from one drive to another faster than a regular SSD but it does absolutely nothing nothing for video games on your PC well besides if you're trying to copy like a hundred one hundred gigabyte PC games from one drive to another all the fucking time then yeah also keep in mind all SSDs unfortunately have something called a terabyte written limit. Whereas a regular hard drive you can save stuff to it as long as the hard drive keeps functioning. All SSDs unfortunately eventually after you save so much stuff to it terabytes in total over time over the years eventually the SSD can die so you'll have to replace it. But don't freak out. Don't think, oh, well, then I'm just going to get a hard drive over SSD then. That's that's not worth it. Don't freak out. I'm going to show you something. So specifically when you get Samsung drives, you'll download a program called Samsung Magician. And as you can see here, I actually have two SSDs installed into this computer I'm recording from. And I've had my computer for damn near three years so far as of this video. Three years. And I have only, on this drive, saved a total of 164 terabyte on this drive i've only saved 80 terabyte most samsung drives have a limit of like 1500 terabyte written and as you can see like i said three years of video enhancement work with all the frames you've seen all the stuff i saved to it all the fucking pc games i saved to this all the movies and videos i saved to this all the video editing i fucking do and i haven't even come close to a 1500 limit that should tell you all you need to know most of you aren't probably gonna do near the amount of stuff that I do on my computer so I can guarantee you the SSDs that you'll probably fucking get it's gonna last you damn near 20 30 fucking years so you'll be all good you'll be all right all right now we are on the best part of the entire video when it comes to computer parts the favorite among the computer parts, the graphics card. Unfortunately, I'm not gonna be able to show you if you are going to need an AMD or an NVIDIA graphics card. However, I can lead you in the right direction based on two factors resolution and graphical memory aka your gaming graphics when it comes to the memory and when you're adjusting the graphics on how much graphical memory you might want when selecting a graphics card make sure your graphics card has been released in the last five years specifically for the best performance for the computer you're building with if you're not sure what release date or year the graphics card was released that you're wanting to select google it google is your friend put the name of the graphics card 1080 ti 2080 ti 2080 super 3090 3090 ti whatever put the name of it then put release date so again if you want the best performance possible specifically with graphics obviously in your video games on pc then try to get a graphics card that's been released in the last five years choose a video card here for our graphics cards obviously now for all of you high graphical pc gamers out there video editors, video enhancers, uh, video AI machine learning people and stuff like that. If you're wanting to do any of that type of stuff or all of that type of stuff at resolutions of like 2K or 1440p or lower 
then ballpark would be between probably a 1080 so an nvidia 1080 graphics card all the way up to like a 2080 graphics card so that would be like anywhere from like a 1080 1080s super if they even have them those i don't think they do but then a 1080 ti then a 1660 and a 1660 ti and maybe a 2080 or even 2080 super however once you get to the 2080 super graphics cards or higher so now we're talking 2080 ti 3080 3080 super 3080 ti the 3060s stuff like that now we're getting into 4k resolution territory and higher like the best the best would be an rtx nvidia 3090 with 8k resolution if you even have an 8k display that's why i said that's the best i can give with a ballpark i can also give you a ballpark with the graphical memory because in my personal opinion i feel like the graphical memory is more important than the type of graphics card that you're going to buy and i'm going to show you why all right so i'm actually running this game in hdr mode all you have to do technically is like right click on your desktop and go to display settings and then turn hdr mode on then you'll run a game and then you go into the options of the game and then turn hdr mode on inside the game now this is what i absolutely love about pc you know you can use the keyboard and mouse obviously but the best part is is yeah and i showed this at the beginning of this uh entire video but yeah i have a playstation 5 controller plugged in and i'm using a program called ds4 windows background which basically converts this controller into like a microsoft xbox controller within windows so windows thinks this is an xbox controller when it really isn't so therefore you know it emulates an xbox controller as you see the bottom, you know, A for OK, Y for quit, and there's no A or Y button on this controller. But you get a drill idea, so you can like switch to and from whenever you want. You can just keep it plugged in, and you can also use the keyboard and mouse uh, whenever you want as well. And then as you can see the bottom, buttons change as you switch to whatever you're using. But nevertheless, what I'm trying to get to, if you go to options, and then you go over to display, as you see here, HDMI mode is on. Now, as you can see over here, right here, graphics memory. I am running an RTX 3090 graphics card. It has around 24 gigabyte of graphical memory. Why does this matter? Well, as you keep changing the resolution or the you know your frame rate, uh, all, the rest of the stuff, your image quality, it affects the amount of graphical memory you're going to be using. Now, here's the crazy part. The more graphical memory you use, the lower your FPS is going to go because it's going to use more processing on your graphics card. So for example, let's just say, you know, image quality right here, it shows a little preview over here, right? Let's just say I keep it all the way at one. Notice as I'm doing that, the processing load and image quality goes down and my graphical memory also goes down. Now, I don't like to put everything at max because then I cannot play at a full like 120 FPS in 4K resolution. I'm using a 4K, uh, well, it's actually a 144 hertz monitor, but it can, yeah, display 120 frames. So for those of you that are wanting to know, well, if I want to play higher than 60 FPS, what type of monitor I would need, that answers your question there. However many frames you want to play that, make sure your display can show those frames via your hertz of your monitor. So for example, if you want to play 120 FPS, make sure you have a monitor that's capable of showing 120 hertz because the hertz tells you this is the amount of images I can display to you. Like I guess that's why I keep V-Sync on because my monitor supports 120 anyway, so I, I can play up to 120 and see all 120 smooth fucking frame rate. But as I change the graphic settings, the graphical memory is going to increase and then I'm not going to be able to play at 120 FPS. It's going to, that 120 FPS is going to go down, 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 okay, as I increase. So you have to sacrifice something. You either want the best, the best fucking graphical quality or you want frames. You can't have both. But again, it depends on your resolution. If, you, if you're doing like a 2K 1440p, on this graphics card, you probably put everything in this game specifically to max and still be like 
2K 120 FPS, but only at 2K resolution. Once you get into 4K 8K territory and then you try to fucking adjust the graphics even higher, then you're not gonna be able to fucking keep your, you know, obviously your frames at max like that. But you get your idea. So keep that in mind when searching for graphics cards. Try to find the best, the best graphical memory. Now, unfortunately, you do like 10 ATIs, 20 ATIs, and 30 80 TIs, even though they're still expensive. Unfortunately, they only have cap of like between 12 to 16. So you're not even gonna be able to uh, use the settings that I'm using. As you can see, I'm already using half of my graphical memory just with these settings alone and I'm, I have 24. So you would max out your graphical memory completely if you like run a 10 ATI, 20 ATI, or 30 ATI at max of a cap like I said 12 or 16. You, you'll be maxed out just with these settings I'm using alone. And, and keep in mind even with these settings alone even though I have 120 frame rate I usually keep that at 1.5 image quality okay and the max is 2 for this game specifically and I don't even stay at 120 maximum at all times. It always drops to like 70 or 80, especially when there's a lot of stuff that's happening on screen. And that's with a 3090. <laughs> so, as I said, you have to just fill around the graphic settings and find like the best, sometimes the, the best graphical and gameplay visualness that you want. So, but yeah, in situations like this where maybe you're trying to record at a really, really really high graphical setting and high frame rate but you notice that your frames are being really really hurt and dropping pretty bad during recording and stuff like that then you can always opt for especially if you can afford it to get another pc and then plug your gaming pc into your recording pc via a internal video capture card that way your frames are not hurting so much. All right, we finally got our graphics card. Finally, 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 yay. The graphics card we're gonna be using in this video that I select as the EVGA GeForce RTX 3080 Ti 12 gigabyte for the Win 3 Ultra Gaming Limited Edition. Of course, now it doesn't matter if it's 12 gigabyte or not. Most PC gamers usually get the 1080 Ti, 20 Ti, 38 Ti, and stuff like that. And they usually only have 12 gigabyte or 16 gigabyte, as I mentioned in the graphics card section. But it's okay because I myself am not gonna be gaming on this graphics this card that often I'll do it every now and then I'll be using this build mainly for like video enhancement machine learning and video editing on my spare time when this computer I'm recording from is busy doing its thing and stuff like that I technically prefer my 3090 because I'm able to increase the graphic settings while retaining frame rate and my graphics gonna look way better with it than a 30 ATI however like I said it's completely okay it's all preference based and uh, the 3090 is meant for content creation mainly anyway not just for gaming but I like the fact that it has a lot more graphical memory in the 3090 allow me to increase my graphic settings and stuff like that so I prefer the 3090s for my PC games but that's just me but anyways so we're gonna click on choose a power supply and believe it or not this is gonna be the last computer part that we need to actually start building the computer yay excluding obviously your desktop monitor which I already told you what type of monitor to get with that through the graphics card section so you're on your own with that as well as desktop speakers keyboard and mice are all universal as long as you get mostly USB whether wireless or not when it comes to the keyboard and mice and of course your desktop speakers it doesn't matter what type you get with that either so you're on your own with all that stuff so power supply last computer part and then we're gonna start actually building our computer so click on choose a power supply and I want to go over a few things and it's really really important obviously since we already know that our motherboard is an ATX motherboard the form factor is ATX so we may have to make sure that our power supply is also ATX but what I really want to really go over is our efficiency ratings I want to go over that first and then we're gonna go over how much wattage we actually need for this build for one, you'll probably get confused. You got gold, platinum, silver, and titanium, all that crap. Well, what does this mean? So as you can see here, efficiency loading. Loading is basically how much of the graphics card you're using at any point in time. So for example, let's just say I know a power supply actually sends power to all your computer components at the exact same time, but we're going to use one computer component 
just for this analogy, I guess, or example, whatever you want to call it, okay? So let's just say you just boot up a game, okay, and you're running the game at max graphical settings and everything. Your graphics card is going to be pushed to 100% power. And let's just give a theoretical wattage here. Let's just say your graphics card is using 500 watts of power, and it needs the full 500 watts of power to perform the best with frames and your graphical settings you have at max, okay? With a bronze power supply, this would mean that the power supply is only going to send the max 500 watts that your graphics card needs for the best performance. It's only going to send that full 500 watts to the graphics card 82% of the time when it's running at full power. I would say, and it's best to usually get gold rating or better. Of course, titanium's the absolute best because, you know, the full wattage that it needs for the best graphical performance will be sent to the graphics card the most often with a titanium. But you get what you pay for in life. You're also looking at four, five hundred or more dollars just for the power supply for the titanium and platinum ones. So that's why I say gold or better. Most people can only afford the gold, but if you can swing the extra 100, 200, 300, 400, whatever you got, you know what I'm saying, for the platinum or titanium, then you'll be better off. Just because you go for the lower one, you know, the gold one, doesn't mean that it's not going to perform amazing in your PC games. It's still going to, you're still going to get extremely high frames, and it's not going to seem like your, you know, your performance is degraded or anything. So don't think that. I'm just telling you, if you want the absolute most a thousand percent best gaming performance your graphics card processor and everything else just performance overall the titanium's where it's at even i can't even afford the titanium power supply sometimes so so gold at least now if you actually go back before we actually hit the choose a power supply as we did earlier look at the top here estimated wattage 564 watts now this is what i was talking about about this pcparkbear.com being wrong what's going to determine most of your watch that your computer is going to pull is going to be your processor and graphics card. So your CPU and your GPU. Them two are the most powerful components in the entire computer that will pull the most wattage. That will give you that number mostly, okay? So just them two alone will give you like 500. And your other 64 watts is the rest of your shit. So I'm going to show you exactly why this estimated wattage is completely wrong. And it has a lot to do with the graphics card. Let me explain. PCPartPicker.com lists the graphics card at 350 watts. But let me explain why this is wrong. If you actually type in NVIDIA 3080 Ti, which is the graphics card we have, click on it, okay, the 38 family of graphics cards, and then you'll click on specs at the top here. Then we're going to click on view full specs, this green button here. Right here, GeForce RTX 3080 Ti, which is the ex even though it's an off-brand, third-party, it's EVGA, it's still the same graphics card. It's still the 3080 Ti. There's several third-party, I'm sure you already fucking know that. You know, NVIDIA makes their own 3080 Ti, and then third-parties use the same NVIDIA graphics chip and then they make their own fucking graphics card based on that still a third it's still the same fucking graphics card though so you get a draw idea so basically like i said geforce rtx 380 ti right on nvidia.com and if you scroll all the way down here what does this say right here don't worry i'll wait pc part picker is using the default wattage it is only counting the default wattage but nvidia is telling you your power supply is required to at least be 750 for their graphics card. That is just the graphics card alone. Why is this such a big difference and jump in wattage here? Why is this at 350 and but the requires for 750? This is why. 350 is what the graphics card runs at by default. So when you turn on your, your computer and you get a display and everything, you know, on the desktop and everything, the graphics card's not doing much. That's when it's at around 350 watts. But as soon as you boot a game, as soon as you Bitcoin mine or cryptocurrency mine or video edit, video encode, or AI machine learn with video uh, software and shit, the graphics card's processing is going to jump from 350 up to 750 watts. Yeah, you get your idea. 
more heat, more electricity, more performance, whether you're overclocking or not. So whether you're overclocking or not, even the graphics card, it's gonna jump for 350 to 750 due to the load being put on it whenever you start gaming and the doing the video shit. So what is the difference here? Basic math, 750 minus 350 is 400 watts. So you go back here and even though PC Part Picker says 564 watts, you have to add 400 watts to that. So technically, all together, this build is going to use 964 watts. Say hello to Dr. Watts. That's why, again, why I said several times in the beginning, before we even started using this website, the RAM is usually wrong that it shows and the wattage. You have to to pay attention. Now that we know that we need at least 964 watts, well they don't make 964 watt power supplies, so all you need is at least a 1000 watt power supply. So click on choose power supply and the gold, we need at least a thousand. So it doesn't really fucking matter. And platinum, see, that, see how expensive the titanium is like I said earlier? <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> But anyways, yeah, so you can always get more wattage power supplies just in case if you want. It's up to you. Yeah, ABJG3, that's the one I'm using. I also forgot to mention there's actually three different types of power supplies that you can actually get. There's modular, semi-modular, and non-modular. And the only difference is basically between the three is that non-modular means that all your computer wires is going to go from the power supply to your computer components comes directly out of the power supply. Semi-modular means that it's half and half. Half of your computer component cables will be coming out of the power supply, and then the other half, you actually have separate wires. You have to plug in one end, and then the other end goes into the computer components. Then, modular, which is fully modular, otherwise known as fully modular, is all your computer components have their own individual wires. You'll plug into the ports individually, and then the other ends go into your computer components. And I like fully modular more because it's better for cable management, and it's a lot easier to manage your wires in better positions, in my opinion. Okay, so here's the things you're going to need. You're obviously going to need a work area. So a uh, table, taller the better. Like that even matters, but whatever. Obviously our actual tools, you know, your flatheads and Phillips head screwdrivers. Get as many variety as you can, just in case we don't know what size the screws are. Get as many Allen wrenches as you can, just in case. Mostly it's the tower cases that you buy that have Allen wrench things. For example, there's like black panels that hold the actual glass on the sides of the tower up, and sometimes those get loose. So you're going to need Allen wrenches for that, obviously, to tighten it back up to the glass. But if you don't get a glass-sided tower case, then you don't really need the Allen wrenches. Anyways, rubbing alcohol is an absolute must. It's for the processor. We'll show you that in a little bit. As well as paper towel. Do not use hand towel. And I'm sure you're not too retarded to use toilet paper, but just in case you are retarded to think that that's wise to use, don't use toilet paper. <laughs> It'll shred all on your motherboard and it's just, no, it's sufficient. <laughs> and also put a towel, and this is mainly for if you got a tower that has glass siding. If you got one that's just all plastic, then it doesn't really matter. You can just, we're going to be lying at flat on its side. Nonetheless, again, if it has glass siding on your tower case, then you need to put a towel down or something soft. So obviously you don't, you know, shatter the glass <laughs> all over the table. The only reason why I'm using this tool, it's actually used to uh, <laughs> clip dog and uh, cat nails, like trim them up and stuff. <laughs> You can laugh at me all you want. But the only reason why I'm using this tool really, really well because I'm, I guess I'm too stupid to know what tool to use for their spacer screws inside the tower. And sometimes it's hard to get them out. And this is like the best tool that i found to actually get the spacer screws out by just putting right over them, clamping them down, and then turning them and keep doing it over and over until they're able to come right out of the tower. I'm sure there's a tool out there that you can take them out with. But nonetheless, <laughs> I'm using this instead. And having some type of bowl for your screws is extremely wise unless you want to use the motherboard box. You're also going to need a USB flash drive here. Make sure it's no more than 32 gigabytes, no less than 8, because some Windows digital images are bigger than 4 gigabyte. No less than 8 gigs, no more than 32 gigs, okay? But make sure it's a USB flash drive, not a USB external. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to install Windows from it. 
uh, any knife you want, doesn't really matter, <laughs> to uh, open up all your boxes of computer parts. <laughs> Thermal paste, a must, without it, you ain't gonna be able to install your CPU to the motherboard, and this is optional. Some thermal pastes come with their own spreading tool. I like to use guitar picks. Either way, some people like to put the thermal paste on the processor and then just put the fan or liquid cooler right on it from there, squishing all the way down. But I like to, after applying the thermal paste, spread the thermal paste myself all over the entire top surface area of the processor before putting the fan or liquid cooler on. So that's just my preference. I have OCD and I just would rather rely on myself to make sure the thermal paste is completely covering the entire top of the processor. Again, that's also optional, but thermal paste is required. Then you're also gonna need a tape measure only because you're gonna also need a graphics card bolster, depending on how heavy your graphics card, well, I'll just get it anyway, but graphics cards are becoming more and more and more heavier, and when you plug it into the motherboard, the last thing you want is when you're keeping their tower completely vertical, the weight of the graphics card is going to bend the pin of itself including the slot that's right under the processor and it's going to damage your motherboard uh, graphics card slot you need to have what's called a graphics card bolster to keep the graphics card completely leveled from its own weight so it won't bend itself and damage your motherboard port I'll explain all that as we get into the video, but I would highly recommend definitely getting a graphics card bolster. Unfortunately, most graphics card bolsters can only support full towers. This is why a tape measure is useful because when you look up bolsters online, it'll tell you what height of the tower it supports. Now there are bolsters, small bolsters for mid towers here, and I'll show you how to install them later in the video but these are specifically for mid towers. The one you can see right here on the right hand side. Last but not least, you might need a separate computer to download the Windows setup to a USB flash drive and just in case your newly built computer does not have internet as soon as you have installed Windows to it. I've came across a situation like that before. So again, if you build your computer, you install Windows to it, and it has no internet at all, then you have to find a way to install the internet driver to it, okay? If you opted for no internal CD and DVD drive, and your motherboard came with a, well, a disc that had drivers on it, then you're going to have to get the drivers another way. So you'll have to download the drivers from the internet. If you have no internet, how are you going to get the drivers? See my point? So, again, having a separate computer just in case. I'm not saying you won't have internet as soon as you install Windows to it, to your newly built computer, but it can happen, okay? So, again, just in case, you can even possibly use your phone. Download, go directly to your motherboard manufacturer's website and download the drivers to your phone and then connect your phone to your computer somehow to copy the drivers and the zip files to those drivers to your newly built computer so you can actually get internet and then download the rest of them. You can do that as well. All right, first things first, we need to take all of our computer parts out of the boxes by first starting with the tower, obviously, because that's what we're gonna be putting the rest of the computer parts into, obviously. And we first by actually taking the glass siding off by the black knobs on this case, so we can actually get on the inside of it on both sides. Also, we need to remove this little white triangle looking thingy, which I don't know what the fuck it's even called or what it's used for. It's just only gonna get in our way, <laughs> especially when we uh, start installing the graphics card. On the other side of the tower, we have our cables that power the tower itself. You know, when you press the power button and the reset button on the tower, turn on your computer. Well, the tower itself has cables for these functions that have to be plugged directly into your motherboard. So what we're going to do is we're going to feed these cables directly through to the inside of the tower. That way it's just a lot easier and we can get it ready for uh, plugging into the motherboard later on all right so as you can see here every tower is different but most towers have these hard drive bays right here on the inside you can set your solid state drives and hard drives onto and then where we're going to be putting our motherboard is where this big empty square hole is right pretty much in the top of the case 
Now this is extremely important before you actually install any of your computer components. Make sure to get rid of all the static electricity in your body. Always, always touch metal surfaces constantly. Some people, even computer experts, even wear gloves when installing their computer parts into their towers. And for good reason. The reason why is because static electricity might not hurt us so much, but it is devastating to computer parts. It can actually fry your computer parts. Yes, <laughs> it is that potent. Now, for those of you that are installing a CPU liquid cooler that I will be showing in this video, we're going to be installing the first half of it first inside the case slash tower before we put the motherboard in. Now, for those of you that are just installing a CPU fan, then you can go ahead and skip the CPU liquid cooler installation. The only difference between the CPU liquid cooler and the CPU fan folk is the folk that is using the CPU liquid cooler will have to install the first half of it, aka the fans, the radiator, or filter, into the top of the case first before putting the motherboard inside the tower. And the CPU fan folk will just go ahead and put the motherboard in now before anything else and then proceed to putting the processor and thermal paste and CPU fan. Now before you put the motherboard there, because the last thing you want is to short out your motherboard, meaning when you turn your computer on, the computer ain't turning on, you'll need to have what's called spacer screws. And the motherboard usually comes with these or the tower usually comes with these. And the tower sometimes should already come with them already in place inside the tower and what you'll do is you'll just put the motherboard directly onto these and also line up the ports of the motherboard directly to the back and you'll see like a rectangular hole in the back for you just to push all the way through you just try to line up the best you can then there are other screws that you'll have to screw into the spacer screws basically sandwiching the motherboard into place so you'll, again, you'll put the motherboard on the spacer screws, line up with the holes around the outer edge of the motherboard, and then you'll use a separate set of screws that either your motherboard or your tower comes with, and you'll screw into the holes of the motherboard, the outer edge of the motherboard, into the spacer screws that the motherboard is sitting on. We're just gonna put this motherboard straight down, and this back end where you see how, where all the ports are, okay, there's only one side of the motherboard that has the actual ports for like the USB ports and all that fun stuff. Well, this side here is going to slide into that slot I mentioned earlier. Okay, like at the back, it's that easy. Now, sometimes the uh, motherboard or the tower comes with a metal plate that you can put there ahead of time before sliding the motherboard into that slot. But I don't really care to do that because most people aren't going to be looking in the back of the computer anyway. <laughs> and some motherboards have a fucking film strip where the ports are. So we're just going to go, and go ahead and remove that real quick. So as you see here that the port area is going to go right through that back. That back fucking port I just showed you. And obviously just make sure you got your wires out of the way. Also make sure to keep touching the metal. Make sure you don't have no static electricity build up. It's extremely important guys, extremely important. Now as you notice, those spacer screws I mentioned earlier, there's holes on the motherboard. Like uh, yeah, right here, right over there, over here, usually on each corner and sides or whatever. Uh, those holes actually line up with the spacer screws of the tower. You'll just use screws that either the motherboard comes with or the tower comes with. If they don't, then again, you have to go to the hardware store, find screws that fit those holes and fit those spacer screws. Those spacer screws have open heads for a reason. When you put the motherboard on top of them, you'll have to screw the motherboard into place into the spacer screws. And as you notice, it is not touching the tower, I can't really like get it all the way down there, but you get a general idea. It's it's lifted up off the tower by the spacer screws. All right, done. I just ended up putting a screw right here, the very, very bottom left in that hole, connecting to that spacer screw. And then I put one over the very top here, connecting that spacer screw. And that's all the ones I really even gonna care about. There's still a hole there, hole there, hole there. You don't have to do them all. As long as it doesn't 
budge much. It's all that matters. So, next step, actually installing the CPU. Keep in mind, this really depends on the processor that you're installing, and also depends on the motherboard you're installing the processor into. Some motherboards and some CPUs install differently. Make sure to consult your motherboard manual. If you do not have a motherboard manual right lying around, or it just didn't come with one, you can always Google your motherboard's model name and then type in manual. For example, this computer that I'm recording from right now as we speak for this part of the video is a Creator TRX40 from MSI. That's its motherboard basically. Go Google it and I click on it and go straight to the motherboard manufacturer's website and then I click on support the top, for me anyway, and I click on documentation. And then right here, manual. They changed the website design now since I've <laughs> recorded the other clips of this video. But so English, and you download it, and then as you can see. But like I said, make sure to consult your motherboard manual, and it'll show you exactly how to install the processor. Now, lucky for probably most of you, most eight core or lower processors are installed with the way that I'm showing in this video right now as we speak. Okay, first things first, we're going to go ahead and touch the metal portion of the tower here, obviously. And the here's a CPU port. You got this little metal bar. All you have to do is, it's, as you can see here, it's on a ledge. You got to pull it towards you just a tiny bit. Pull it up to open the uh, holes of the socket. Then, as you can actually notice, if I zoom in here, you'll notice that there's an arrow on the uh, corner of the socket, okay? Right there. It's engraved into the plastic. And it's the only corner that has an arrow. This arrow is important because I'm gonna show you why. Here's the processor, okay, with all the pins. Some processors don't have pins. Some are just have golden squares at the bottom. Now, if you look at the bottom of it, what do you notice? That's right, where my thumb is. See that little golden arrow? Yeah, we're gonna line it up with that socket. So the arrow of the CPU and the arrow of the socket. We're gonna put it right in there, okay? It only goes in one way, you don't gotta push. Just gotta move it a little bit until it just falls in there. Look at that, simple. Easy fucking peasy. Then we can go ahead and push it down just, tight, just barely, gently. You'll know if it drops in the holes, trust me. Then afterwards, this lever here, we're gonna push it down. Then we're gonna pull it towards us and get it under that little ledge. Done. Next step. A reminder, if you are installing a CPU liquid cooler instead of a CPU fan. Do not, I repeat, do not apply thermal paste yet. If you are just installing a CPU fan, then what I'm going to show you is how to apply thermal paste. Next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take our thermal paste here. Make sure it's facing actually up so you don't actually drip it on the motherboard. And then once you unscrew it loose enough, we're going to barely take the cap off because it can drip e super easily, okay? As you can see, it's just like a syringe. Just like a syringe. What we're gonna do is we're going to do a dime-sized amount directly in the center of the processor. Now usually with 32 core processors or higher, we usually bigger processors, so instead of a dime size, I use like a quarter size. <laughs> Either way, I usually use a guitar pick or a um, scraper that sometimes comes with thermal paste to spread it over the surface though. Since this liquid CPU cooler for this uh, motherboard will not cover the entire processor, I just need to spread the thermal paste just enough that it's just gonna be big enough for this. I guess. So as you can see here, I spread it the best I can. For this processor, like I said, the liquid CPU cooler is not gonna be able to cover the entire processor, it just covers most of the middle. I just don't want, like for example, if I put this on, you'll notice that even with the angle that the corners are gonna be exposed. 
I mean, it still covers it with the bracket and everything, right? But the processor is not going to be completely covered with the uh, heat sink of the liquid CPU cooler. It just covers most of it, but not the whole thing, which is not a problem. It's just I can't put thermal paste across the whole surface area of this processor. And like I said, this is my 32 core uh, processor. I just cannot put it like over the entire thing. I can only put it just enough like close to the corners just not too close to the corners you're not going to be able to get this perfect either but nevertheless i'm going to try anyway <laughs> shit it's caking on the guitar pick like i said you're not going to be able to get it perfect but i uh, spread it the best i can like i said it's a bigger processor but my uh, cpu liquid cooler cannot uh, cover the whole processor because covers most of it but not all the way out to the corners of the processor so i just spread it the best i can not too close to the corners and then i also put a little bit more in the middle because this the bronze portion is going to go straight on on into the middle and then uh, therefore squishing it down and spreading it out evenly uh anyways in uh, certain spots that i have haven't got it completely covered with thermal paste and if you use the entire syringe, it's okay. You don't necessarily have to use the whole fucking thing, though. Just make sure that you keep the nozzle of the thermal paste away from the rest of the motherboard. And lift it up a little bit, like this. And then we're gonna take it away from the motherboard. Most people either A, now put their CPU fan on, or their liquid cooler on. I don't. I like to use a guitar pick. Why? I like to spread the thermal paste around the top portion of the processor. That way, just in case I put a CPU fan down or the CPU liquid cooler down, thermal paste is covering the whole top portion of the processor, not just the fucking center of it. Because you never know, it might get squished down and the corners still might be exposed to heat. Therefore, we are using a guitar pick. So, let's get started. I gotta be careful not to push it too far because since it's extremely thick, it can go right off the processor all over the damn motherboard. Now, if you do get any thermal paste on the motherboard itself, then that's okay. You can use paper towel, dab some rubbing alcohol on it, and use the paper towel to wipe the thermal paste off the motherboard. Just try not to get any thermal paste on any computer components that are sticking out of the motherboard, like those little cylinder gray looking things in the motherboard, or any of the small itty bitty ports, or any of the slots or and stuff like that but if you get like thermal paste like on the flat surface parts of the motherboard then like i said that's completely okay just like i take rubbing alcohol and paper towel and keep rubbing on it until the thermal paste is off the motherboard now i'm not going to spread it all the way to the corners i am just going to spread it close to the edges the closest i can does not have to be perfect when you're done a lot of the thermal paste is still going to be stuck to the guitar pick and you don't also have to do this at all. You can just put the thermal paste down and then put the fan down or your liquid CPU cooler. I just have OCD and I like to fucking spread the thermal paste first beforehand. And I don't like to just squash it down. Trust me when I say spreading the thermal paste, if you're doing it my way, is as easy as spreading your girlfriend's legs for the first time. <laughs> If you have a CPU fan that already has screws connected to it, then what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to remove these black plastic bars here that you see that have two screws in them a piece. You will remove these two black plastic bars, including the screws, and then where those screws were screwed into with the holes and everything, you will be putting your CPU fan down on top of the processor screwing down the screws into those holes instead. Some motherboards don't even have these black plastic bars slash brackets. So you can just apply thermal paste and then put the CPU fan that has the screws already with it and you can just screw it right into place. What you'll do is you'll take your CPU fan and as I mentioned earlier, every motherboard's different. If there is no black bar brackets, then you're free to just put it straight on. Each screw of the fan will line up with these holes. It only goes in one way, it's rectangular. So you can do it that way or that way. So anyways, you put it straight down, you try to line up best you can, and you put the screw, like I said, line the screws up. But this motherboard has a back plate from the other side of the tower, unfortunately. You have to actually push into to give your CPU fan the screw holes. 
yeah, it's stupid. So you have to hold this down into place before actually screwing down the screws into each individual hole. It's fucking stupid, I know. Luckily for us, the motherboard that we're gonna be using in this video, in the main build of this video, this is a completely different motherboard to show you for the CP fan, but luckily for us, we don't have to fucking deal with this bullshit, okay? For the motherboard we're gonna be using mainly in the video for like the liquid CPU cooler and like I said, the main build. Anyways, you need to screw in the holes three or four times all the way around on each screw of the CPU fan. If you do not do this, what's gonna end up happening is, let's just say that you think, okay, I just wanna screw in this all the way down, and then try this one all the way down. You're gonna come into a situation where this bottom, these two bottom screws, you're not gonna be able to connect to the screw holes. You'll push all the way down and you're still not gonna be able to fucking screw them in because they'll be too high up and you, you cannot push them all the way into the screw holes because this side is screwed down all the way and it's, it's keeping the entire CPU fan from being pushed down all the way down on the other side. I would say between three to six times on each screw and you'll keep doing this over and over and over again until the screws cannot move anymore. And then all you do is just take the wire here from the CPU fan and every motherboard right there is the port CPU fan. <laughs> and as you see on above the port as well, there's like a little uh, sliver of plastic at the top of it. Well, the plug itself also has uh, grooves that go right on that. Four holes, four pins, and just line up. Push all the way down so it can't go anymore. You also might notice that some CPU fans only have three hole plugs, but the CPU fan header, aka CPU fan port on your motherboard has four pins. That is completely okay. You can still plug in the CPU fan three hole plug into the four pin CPU fan header. There will just be one pin left over. There, CPU fan is installed, done. But if you have a CPU fan that has buckles, then you do not need to remove these black plastic bars. All you have to do is once you apply the thermal paste, just put this type of fan straight on the processor and then hook the buckles into the black plastic bars on each side. Then of course, connect the CPU fan cord to the CPU fan fan plug-in like I showed with the previous fan. All right, now I'm gonna be showing you how to install the liquid CPU cooler. Now this is only for those of you that are not installing a CPU fan directly onto the processor. Obviously you're not gonna be using a CPU fan and a CPU liquid cooler at the exact same time on the same processor. <laughs> In the same build, anyway. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you need to install the fans that come with your liquid CPU cooler. You need to screw in these into the radiator slash filter and make sure all the fans are facing downward and facing the exact same direction as the tubing. If the tubing is going downward, then the fans need to be installed facing downward. I'm just trying to save you guys the headache because I made that mistake by accidentally screwing in the fans on the top of the radiator and the tubing was going downward from the filter and then I realized, wait a minute, since the tubing is going downward, the top of the radiator is what's going to be screwed in to the top of the tower. If you screw in the fans to the top of the radiator, you will not be able to screw <laughs> the radiator to the top of the case. <laughs> now, don't worry about the wires right yet. We're gonna focus on the big chunky portion. We will be connecting to the processor itself after obviously applying thermal paste. Now, most all-in-one liquid coolers like this already have, well, I guess prepped, if you will, thermal paste already applied on it, but I never trust it, so I still prefer to add thermal paste on my processor before for installing a liquid CPU cooler, whether there's prepped thermal paste already on the liquid cooler or not. I don't care, I don't trust it. <laughs> 
But anyways, we need to focus on putting this together first and the manual will literally show you how to connect the wires as well as this chunky portion that I'm talking about. But I will tell you ahead of time that the chunky portion here that's actually going to be connected to the processor is a little bit more complicated and it's actually the most frustrating. It is a pain in the ass to put together with the brackets, but I'm sure you're smart and I'm sure you'll figure it out. And obviously depending on the processor you get will depend on what bracket you're gonna be using for this liquid CPU cooler. Well, any liquid CPU cooler for that matter. All right, now we're actually going to be installing our radiator slash filter of the CPU liquid cooler, AKA the first half of the liquid CPU cooler into the tower, the top of the tower. And in this portion of the video, you might even notice that the motherboard is already inside the tower, even though I told you guys to make sure to install the radiator of the CPU liquid cooler to the top of the tower before putting your motherboard in, because the motherboard's going to get in your way when you put the radiator in. And that's also from my personal experience. Well... Contrary to belief, the reason why you're seeing the motherboard in this portion of the video is this is actually not even the motherboard we're going to be using in the main build. This is actually the motherboard that I threw on the ground and threw away that I showed a couple times throughout this video uh, for one. So I took it out of the tower anyway. Piece of shit motherboard that I'm not going to use no more. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. No, 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 no. No! Hell no! For two, I had to remove the motherboard out anyway, because like I said, it was getting in my way when I was trying to screw in the radiator of the liquid CPU cooler. But nevertheless, your CPU liquid cooler will come with a manual that will show you actually how to screw in the radiator after you screw in all the fans to the radiator and stuff like that. It's just better for dust management if you have the fans facing downward just with the piping facing downward also, like I said. That way, whenever your CPU is getting hot, all of the dust that gets accumulated will end up being stuck on the top of your case and the top of the radiator that way periodically you can unscrew the radiator when your computer's off and stuff like that to clean it a lot easier and that way the dust from your cpu liquid cooler will not actually get inside your computer case nevertheless in my personal opinion, the best positioning for the radiator to install, aka screw into the top of the tower, I recommend the tubing being closest to the back of your tower. Then after we install our radiator from the liquid CPU cooler to the top of the case, we will then put the motherboard inside the case if it's not already in the tower already, as I showed earlier. Then after that, we put the processor in the motherboard as I showed earlier as well. Then we will apply thermal paste a dime sized amount to the center of the processor. You could spread it with a guitar pick or a spreading tool that comes with your thermal paste or you don't have to spread it at all. But either way, I do not trust the liquid CPU cooler that has thermal paste pre-applied to it. I do not trust it. Again, for a third time, I do not trust it. <laughs> then what you will do is you'll take the second half of the liquid CPU cooler, obviously, that's connected to the radiator that we screwed in earlier to the top of the tower. And since we already put it together with the bracket and everything, we will basically put it right on the top of the processor with the black plastic bars aka black plastic brackets still already in the motherboard and just like the buckle fan I showed earlier we're just going to hook in the CPU liquid cooler processor connected portion to these black plastic brackets that have hooks on them. Now you might find it a little difficult to do this because well if you hook one end you might find it incredibly difficult to hook the other end. If this happens to you you will unfortunately, and you might need help, unfortunately, for this, a second hand, but you will have to unscrew one of the black plastic brackets and lift it up just a tad. You do not have to unscrew the black plastic bracket all the way off of the motherboard. Just unscrew it enough to loosen it up so you can hook the 
CPU liquid cooler CPU connected portion to it first. Then once you connect it to the black plastic bracket, then you can screw the black plastic bracket right back down to the motherboard again with the CPU liquid cooler CPU connected portion attached to it. Then of course after you have finally hooked in the CPU liquid cooler CPU connected portion to the black plastic brackets on both sides then you'll just take a Phillips head screwdriver or flathead whatever the screw is that's connected to your uh, CPU liquid cooler CPU connected portion as you can see here and screw it officially all the way down until it cannot screw in anymore. Let's continue connecting all three of the fans of the radiator of it together and all LED lights of it into the motherboard. Okay, you're gonna have quite a few wires. You're gonna have your remote control wire. There's actually two ways to plug in the liquid CPU cooler. You can either A, plug it all in, then plug it straight into the motherboard via a main board sync way. That way you can control the LED lighting and stuff like that via software and Windows. Or you can do it my way, which I find is the better option in my opinion, because I can do it whenever I want. Even Windows is not even up is install the remote control that controls the LEDs, the light speed, and the color, all of it. And that's the way we're gonna be installing this. And the other wire we're gonna be having is an adapter that has one and then it splits into three. Then, obviously as you can see, every single fan, as I mentioned earlier in this video, has two wires. A chunky wire at the end, and then splits into two, well, two smaller ones. One is a male, the other one is a female, okay? And you'll see why this is all important. You'll take this small rigid wire here and you'll plug this into the port labeled CPU underscore fan. Usually it's labeled CPU underscore fan one or two or it could be zero, whatever. Depend on the motherboard. You can also plug in this rigid wire into a port called pump fan. It'd be pump fan one or pump fan two. Some motherboards even have W underscore pump. Some motherboards won't even let you boot up the computer unless you have a CPU fan or a CPU liquid cooler plugged in to the CPU underscore fan port. So honestly, your best bet is just to plug it into the CPU underscore fan port, in my honest opinion. This rigid wire will work on both ports, the CPU underscore fan port or the pump ports. With the CPU liquid cooler, there is an extra smaller wire that I did not mention that comes out of the same end as the CPU fan rigid wire. But this wire is cylindrical and it feels more rubbery. I find it best to have each fan's wires completely separated so there is no confusion on which one is which. Okay, so let's connect it all. All right, first thing we need to do is we need to take the cylindrical cord from the actual liquid CPU cooler that's left over. Obviously not the one that we plugged into the CPU fan port, but the other one that's next to it, and it feels more rubbery. And we're gonna plug it into the first fan, the very first fan of the connected radiator or filter or the fuck you wanna call it. So, and there's only one wire from the first fan that we plug it into. We're obviously not plugging into the big chunky one, it won't fit. And in this one, as I mentioned earlier, the smaller one, this is the one we're gonna plug it into. One end is a male, one is a female. Common sense. The one that goes straight to the all-in liquid cooler, okay, at the end here, is a male. So the male goes into the female portion of the first fan at the top, okay? If you find it hard to disconnect them if you have to, it's easier than you think it is. Just make sure you have, I guess, pretty good uh, long fingernails, I guess. And as you can see, you'll put your fingernail right here, okay? In between this edge here and this edge on both sides. And then you'll just pull them apart. Trust me when I say it's a pain in the ass if you don't do it this way. Extremely difficult to disconnect them again. And like I said earlier, they only connect one way. 
Again, I'm sure you're not too retarded. I'm sure you'll figure it out. Okay, and this is what I mean by the wires can get kind of complicated. So as you can see here, we connected the liquid CPU cooler to the first fan at the top. And as you'll notice, there's still a wire, the big chunky wire left over from the first fan. Leave that wire alone. Make it actually look like a damn dick for right now. It's okay. <laughs> Now we're going to take this in and we're going to change this dick and I guess make it look like an ass <laughs> by plugging in this corner end. And we're going to plug that into the only female end of, you guessed it, the second fan. All right, done. That's one weird looking ass. <laughs> so now the first fan and the second fan are completely connected to each other via these wires. And of course, You'll notice that each of them still have their big chunky ones left over. Leave them alone for right now. Now, again, you guessed it, we're going to plug in the male end of the corner of this one, of the second fan. And we're going to put it into this one, of the third fucking fan. Male into female. Alright, now it should look like so. Looks like, uh, I don't know what it looks like, but <laughs> one messed up. Fucking ass, I guess. <laughs> but yeah, it should look just like this. Now, as you notice, there is still an end left from the third fan. Guess what that one plugs into? That's right, our remote control. As you can see. Then, I will show you later, this end just goes straight into the power supply. Easy. Peasy. Now, the last three chunky wires are going to be all plugged into this adapter. Now, getting them in order, probably your best bet. I don't think it matters, but whatever. I'm going to do it in order according to this. First fan, second fan, third fan. Easy. Let's make sure all the chunky plug-ins from each fan at the top is on top of the wires we just connected to each other. Okay? That way, the wires do not get tangled that easy, and this makes everything so much easier via cable management. So there we go, they're all on top. All three of these are going that's left over from these three fans are going to plug into that adapter. All right, all three of the fans, their big chunky wires are connected to the adapter. Where do we plug this in at, you ask? Well, it can plug into any system fan port. This motherboard has SYS fans, these SYS fan one, two, three, four at the bottom there. And then there's one over here. There's a five, it's about six, six different ones. And you can just plug them into any one of them. So I'm probably just going to choose one on the right hand side over here. I plugged in the uh, three fans with the chunky cord and the adapter that turned into one. Plug that into the system fan one. Then last but not least, you'll plug the remote control into your power supply that I'll show how to connect everything to later in the video. And then liquid CPU cooler is officially installed. Like I mentioned earlier, there is actually two ways to install a CPU liquid cooler. Some CPU liquid coolers only give you one way, and that's the motherboard main sync way, which does not involve connecting a remote control. This liquid CPU cooler that I showed and demonstrated in this video allows you to install it both ways, a remote control route, or the main board sync route. Now, if you're wondering what the main board sync route is, if I didn't already mention it, it just allows you to only control the lights of your fans of the CPU liquid cooler through Windows via software. You cannot change the color and all that stuff via the remote control inside your tower because obviously you haven't connected the remote control and you're not using that route. Your CPU liquid cooler will come with its own manual showing you how to install both if it comes with both methods. If not, it'll still show you how to connect it via the main board route. I do not have to show you that, but usually it's just two extra wires. Not really that difficult. Go to town. Honest, I should have did this to the CPU socket before I put the processor in, but oh well. Trail still turn on just fine. Be completely okay. All 
All right, I showed you guys how to install your CPU into your motherboard based on the socket types both have, as long as they both are the same. Showed you how to apply thermal paste to your CPU, and I also showed you how to install your CPU fan or slash and CPU liquid cooler, whichever one you wanted to use for that. Now I'm going to show you how to remove the CPU from the motherboard. Now why would you want to do this? Well, maybe your CPU that you currently have, maybe it broke down or maybe it's uh, getting too hot and you want to reapply new thermal paste on it and reposition it. Or maybe you are getting a brand new CPU to replace the old one that broke or something. Who knows? Whatever excuse is, I'm going to show you how to do that. But what I mainly want to show you is how to remove remove thermal paste if you accidentally get thermal paste on the pins of your processor yes don't get scared if this ever happens more likely to happen if you remove the cpu from your motherboard sometimes you have no choice but to remove it from the motherboard like i said from the variables i said earlier but when you do have to remove it sometimes when you lift it up out of the motherboard you might accidentally have some drip underneath it onto the pins and i'm going to show you how to remove the thermal paste from the pins all right so first things first to make sure that we don't accidentally drip any thermal paste right onto the cpu pins underneath it when taking this processor out of the motherboard we need to take our paper towel here as well as rubbing alcohol what we're going to do is we're going to take the rubbing alcohol and we're going to dab it onto the paper towel. We're not going to soak the paper towel, we're going to dab it, okay? Then we're going to take that dabbed spot of the paper towel and then we're going to rub on the processor over and over and over again. When doing this, make sure that you are rubbing in a circular motion okay this way you're not like literally rubbing or shoving the freaking thermal paste from your processor onto the motherboard okay you're technically trying to pick up the thermal paste with your paper towel off of the processor and away from your <laughs> computer so anyways you'll just keep rubbing it over and over again if it's not coming up then that's when you'll have to dab your paper towel with rubbing alcohol again and keep repeating this over and over and over again until you get most of the thermal paste off of your processor after this just like i showed earlier how to actually put the processor in the motherboard we're going to take that little metal thing and of course every motherboard's different so the socket might be different for you depending on the motherboard you get but for this one obviously in this we're going to take the metal bar just like we did when we installed it we're going to do well the same thing to take it out we're going to take the metal bar pull it towards us lift all the way up all the way up and then we're going to take like our fingernails like our i forget what it's called this is the index finger your index finger and your thumb and you're going to like like a pinching uh symbol with your hand and we're going to grab the edges of the processor and we're going to lift straight up and take it right out of the motherboard make sure you have like a plastic container maybe a plastic i wouldn't say a plastic bowl but just any anything to protect the pins of the processor make sure you're setting the pins of the processor on something that will not damage the pins if you accidentally got thermal paste on the pins underneath it whenever you remove it then you can always use a toothbrush <laughs> first get rubbing alcohol pour it in like a little small bowl or like a lid or something and you need to dip the toothbrush in the rubbing alcohol and then gently don't push on it because you can bend the pins but you just gently rub on it over and over and over again you know one direction then soak it to get all whatever on that's on the toothbrush back in this lid or bowl or whatever soaking it again and then go the other direction keep doing that until the remaining thermal paste is uh, gone because nowadays thermal paste is not conductive meaning that you just need to remove most of it, but you don't have to remove all of it, if that makes sense. Just enough that the pins themselves of the CPU can make contact with the motherboard.
once you spent damn near like 10, 20 minutes using that toothbrush and rubbing alcohol to get any thermal paste off of the pins of the CPU, then you need to set the processor down somewhere, pins facing up obviously, and let it dry out. Again, since thermal paste is not conductive, this means that as long as you got most of the thermal paste off and the thermal paste is not on the top and middle portions of the pins, then the pins should still be able to make contact with the motherboard and the motherboard should still be able to read and use the processor because, you know, it uses the pins to read from. But if there's thermal paste on the pins, then it's not going to be able to read off the pins. Therefore, just make sure all... It better be safe and sorry. Just get all the thermal paste off of it if you can. Okay? Just, yeah. <laughs> All right, first things first, we need to remove, well, move all of these liquid CPU cooler wires out of the way. Good enough. Next thing we need to do is we actually need to, believe it or not, the towers themselves, if you aren't aware, have their own wiring that come with it, okay? Otherwise, the buttons of the tower, including the ports of it, would not work. So on this tower, it's all glass. So let's go ahead and remove all of these screws here. I told you I had little soft washers on them so they don't crack the glass. Okay, there I guess there's one too. <laughs> okay, this, yeah, like a car door. Anyways, so as you see here, got all these wires, okay? All of these, every single one of these, plugs directly into the motherboard. So, this is why there's holes on the side we can feed the wires through. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Okay? Alright, already did so. Now we can just go ahead and close this back up here. Again, every tower is different. Some towers you'll have to actually slide to the side. And then the sides pop off. This one's special, I guess. Special. All right, done, screwed back in. Let's go to the other side. Let's start with the most complicated wires first from the tower, the smallest ones. There's individual itty bitty plugs. These are the most complicated to plug in. We're gonna start with those first, then move on to the rest. The rest are fucking easy. Now, your motherboard will have either a quick installation guide or a manual, should have both. But it tells you exactly how they should be plugged in okay as you can see by these individual smaller ones if you don't know which one is the positive and negative all you have to do is look on the back of them okay where the shiny pieces are you can see it's like one right here it says hd plus and negative so to know which one is the positive and negative side all you have to do is look on the back ends and there's a engraved arrow this engraved arrow on the back of them is the positive end okay again the arrow hole is the positive end so now you know how they're supposed to be plugged in if the quick installation guide is not enough and it still confuses you it is quick installation guide for a reason use the full manual Okay, and it goes into more detail with an even better layout. Honestly, this is what I usually use. If your motherboard did not come with either installation guide or the motherboard manual, then you can always download the manual via a PDF straight from the manufacturer's website by looking up the motherboard as I showed earlier in this video. So obviously according to the manual here, it's circled at the bottom right hand corner. So if we look at the motherboard here, we can put it in the tower correctly. Here it is, JFP1. So this is where we're gonna be plugging all of these itty bitty small fucking plugs into. Now, if you feel like these plugs are too close together, you can pull them apart just a little bit. They will not damage the wires. They have shielding for a reason. And that's why I personally like to do. We're gonna start with the HDD LED though. And from the manual here, you see here, it's gonna go on the bottom left two pins. So the positive side and the negative side, okay? So the HDD LED, it's upside down, sorry. <laughs> HDD LED, plus or minus, like I told you earlier, the positive side is the arrow, okay? On the back side of it, the fucking engrooved arrow. So wherever the positive is, yeah, it's on the right-hand side. 
on my finger. So yeah, we're going to flip it over. We're gonna do that way. Guided, the arrow goes into the positive side. So it's gonna be just like this, plugged in. So, JFP1, where are you at, dog? All right, there you are. Again, positive side. The arrow is gonna go into the first pin of JFP1. Next one is the reset switch, okay? Right next to it, reset switch. But as you can see, it's gonna be flipped. The negative is gonna be on the left-hand side and the positive is gonna be on the right. And it's already connected to the HDD LED wire. And we set, as we separated it earlier a little bit, as you can see. So based on the manual, it says negative first. So check the back end, see where the positive's at. Okay, so as you can see, it's at the top here. So this end, is going to be on the right hand side. So let's flip it like so. It's gonna be just like this. Plug that in right beside the HDD LED we just plugged in. Into those two pins. Easy peasy. The HDD LED one is gonna have the arrow facing up and the reset switch one is gonna be flipped with the words facing up. All right, so as you can see, the very, very, very last pin and that whole area there is completely reserved, aka blank, nothing gets plugged into it. As you can see, that last pin that's exposed, we leave alone. And obviously there's no pin there, so nothing's gonna be plugged in there. All right, next is our power LED at the top. See, as you notice, I like to start from the bottom, work my way up, so shit don't get in my way. So let's look for the power LED switch here. So those are the smallest wires. Oh, fucking joy to the world. <laughs> Let's go ahead and separate uh, the two smaller ones from the big one a little bit. Pull them apart a little bit. So we have room to work with. And like I said, we're going to start with the f these fucking small ones. They're always a pain in the ass. Fair warning. So as you see by the manual, the positive one is going to go into the first port. These are the only ones that are separated and not into one chunky plug. The positive one will go in first. And these are the only ones that are also labeled directly with the wording. There is no arrows in the back of them. The positive one will go in first. The negative one goes right next to it. Easy peasy. So the first part, just really, really hard because angling in it, angling in it is really kind of difficult because they're so damn small. Okay, next one, which is the negative one, okay, goes into this one right beside it. I wasn't joking when I said <laughs> these are the hardest to work with. <laughs> They're so fucking small. Trying to get them into the pen is extremely difficult. All right, cool, done. Last one is obviously our power switch. That way our power button on the top of the tower will actually boot up the computer. So our right power switch is upside down, but this one says positive and negative. So, of course, same thing like earlier. There's an arrow showing you which one's the positive side. So that one is gonna go in first. All right, so positive side on the left-hand side, make sure it's lining up. All right, there's the arrow side. So just gonna plug it in as so, with the arrow side facing up into the last two pins at the top. All right, now we gotta plug in the last of them. The blue one's the easiest. This is USB 3.0 to make sure your blue USB ports work on your tower. <laughs> now, these are all labeled, but some plugs are labeled white, some are just engraved. With this one, these are just engraved. HD audio, the other one is uh, USB, so this works for the regular USB 2.0 ports, the older USB ports on the top of the tower. And this is how easy it is, as you can see. And again, if you're still confused on what they are supposed to be plugged into, the manual will tell you. For example, the audio, J-Audio, this connector allows you to connect audio jacks in the front panel, aka the top of your fucking tower. The audio jacks for your headphones and stuff like that. So without this plugging in the motherboard, your headphone port of your tower ain't gonna fucking work. So, it's common knowledge. That's the wrong fucking one. <laughs> okay, but it's J Audio 1. Every motherboard is labeled differently, but your motherboard will tell you what is what. J Odd 1. So, where is J Odd 1? And it's at the bottom. They even label it for you by circling it. But, again, all motherboards and manuals are different. So, from the bottom left-hand corner, bam. Easy. So you'll plug this whole fucking thing in, 
It says HD audio. Look like this whole thing only goes in one way. There is one port that is completely sealed off. As you can see, same thing on the port. There is only one area that has no pin. So, line it up. Don't be retarded. Done. Then, as you can see, the USB 2.0 ports on the top of the tower to make sure they work. And they plug into basically any one that says J-U-S-B. Okay, any of them, J-U-S-B, whatever. Like I say, every motherboard's different, refer to your manual if you're confused on where it goes. So, same thing as the HD audio, there's only one fucking pin that's empty, okay? So this one right here has an empty slot. So we're going to flip this one around and line it up. Again, don't be retarded. Make sure all of these cables are completely flush with the motherboard. Make sure not to damage the pins or the wires, but push them in via the plastic plugs in as much as you can so they are completely plugged in. The last thing you want is loose wires. Also, you might come across some things that your tower does not have. For example, this motherboard has a connector for USB type C if the tower has it on the top. Okay, as you can see, this connector allows you to connect like yada 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 type C on the front panel. So since this tower does not have a USB type C, as you can tell, it just has two USB 2.0 and USB 3.0, we are not gonna be plugging anything into those. However, like it matters, as you can tell, any USB cord usually plugs into any of the J USBs except USB 3.0. It is the only cord, as you can tell, that will plug into a specific plug. And it is the only spot on the motherboard that will literally say USB 3, or it could say USB 3.0. It is common sense. There's a little groove there, and there's a groove at the top. Line it up, plug it in, and you are done. Done. Now, with the fan over here that's inside the tower, this can plug into any port that says system fan, SYS. They're all numbered. If you have multiple fans inside your tower, they will all plug into SYS fan. Okay, next is installing our RAM. Extremely easy. Refer to your motherboard manual on determining how to slide them in because you cannot for example if you only have two sticks like in our case you can not just plug them in side by side it does not work that way unfortunately they usually have to be separated by another empty ram slot as you can tell so if you only have one stick it tells you right there which one to plug it into so if you only have one stick it'll go into the second one from the left Dimma 2, right here, Dimma 2. So if you only have one, it's gonna go into this one right here only. If you have two, like in our case, same thing, but we're gonna have one right here, and the other one is gonna go at the very end. They're gonna be separated by an empty slot. So obviously, according to the motherboard manual, I have to play into the second slot. So skip the first slot, we're going to the second one. And again, it's extremely easy. All you gotta do is push these up. Some motherboards have only one side that flick up or down. But most have, they're like I said, they're like, like switches. You just pull them up, this side, push it down. So the coolest part is just make sure it's completely lined up with the slot, both sides when you put it in, and you'll push it down. Sometimes you'll have to click one side and click the other one, but try to get them as even as you can when clicking it. I'm sure you heard that. Then obviously according to the motherboard manual, skip one and the second one goes into the very, very last one, the right hand side. So again, it's only one way. You can, if you already put one in, you can do it based off that. So just make sure it's exactly you know the same. Flick it up, flick it up, line it up with the slot and then try to push it down until it clicks on both sides. There you go. RAM is installed, that easy. There's only one little empty slot here at the bottom of the chip. As you see here, there is a groove right in the middle. There's only one way to put it in. If you put it in one way and you try to push it down, you might notice it does not 
line up. So let's do the slot I'm supposed to go in, right? And you'll notice with the groove, it does not line up. The groove does not line up with the groove down there. So you have to flip it. Install the graphics card. Remove the back panels. Congratulations, you have space to put the big ass chunky graphics card in, okay? Now, if you have an older graphics card or even a used one, well, you'll have to remove the uh, dust from it to make it look even more prettier, okay? You can use the air compressor I used earlier, but I'm not doing that because this does not have that much dust on it. So, this is how we would do this. The first lined silver thingamabob there, as you can see, this right here, okay? With this wire out of the way. It's gonna plug right into that. As you can see with the graphics card, there is a slot thingamabob here. Actually, matter of fact, I'm gonna go ahead and use the air compressor on the top of this. Okay, anyways. Ah! Oh no. Oh shit, I hope the graphics card's okay. Are you okay? Are you okay, my darling? Are you okay? Are you okay? There, there. There, there. It's okay. There's isn't rattle on it or anything. It's heavy. A $2,000 graphics card, it better fucking work. <laughs> if it's that easy to break it, it shouldn't be $2,000. <laughs> anyways, moving on here. So, just make sure all the fucking wires are out of the way. And as you can see, you know, by the uh, silver port and then groove, groove, and just line it up. And this metal portion here actually goes in between the side of the motherboard and your tower. Let's uh, do this. Okay. It's just, just like that. And we're going to push it down a little bit and it clicks in. Well, should click in, but. And you'll know it's clicked in because there is a lever here that should like pop towards you. And this should show you I'm talking about, go ahead and push it down. Okay, it releases the graphics card so you can pull it back out again. Usually you have to pull on the graphics card while you're pressing the lever down to get the graphics card out. But yeah, so as you can see, lines up in the port and then the metal portion goes just on the side of the motherboard. Goes in there and you shoot the lever there, push it down till it clicks in best you can doesn't gotta be perfect but just you push it down as best you can into the motherboard and until you think it's completely flush you can put a little bit force into it not too much but a little just a little bit and then you take one of the screws that you uh, took out to remove the panel and then we're going to put it into the hole here of the graphics card to you know obviously to hold the graphics card against the, uh, the tower so it's going to be right into that hole right there through the hole of the graphics card now, you might have to actually push the graphics card towards the back of the tower like so. And also use your fingers and put the screw in first. Okay, all at the same time. So like I said, use one hand to actually push it a little bit towards the back of the tower. And then the other hand to try to put the screw into the hole. So you can use a screwdriver to screw it all the way down. It is a pain, but I'm sure you'll figure it out like I just did. Next thing we're going to do is use this bolster from MSI. And uh, you can use our brand ones too if you have one. If you don't, then you can order one online. Well, what, based on what a bolster does, since the graphics card is really heavy, when we lift it up, okay, we do not want the weight of the graphics card to bend. Because as you could tell earlier, the chip portion that goes into the PCI silver slot here, the chip portion of the graphics card can bend just because of the weight. So when you stand it up or whatever, the graphics card can just lean itself this way, especially over time. And the chip portion of the graphics card can bend as well as possibly damage the slot that this is slid into. To make sure that doesn't happen, we need a way to lift the graphics card up and to keep it lifted up so it doesn't basically weigh itself down automatically. So we have to use a graphics card bolster. Now the one I'm showing in this video is only for a full tower. If you get a mid tower, this bolster will not fit inside of it. This is why it's important to have that measuring tape I showed earlier in the beginning of this video on the tools that you're going to need when building your computer because you'd have to measure how tall your tower is and how tall the bolster is. Even if you compress it all the way down, it might not fit inside the tower still. There are other bolsters you can buy. I believe they're called bolsters, but 
instead of being compressed, being able to push back down and then like a spring loader mechanism, these are just flat metal, I guess, a guard rail that you will screw into maybe two to three screw holes below your graphics card. And then it just sits on top of it. And the only way you can actually keep it even with your graphics card and level is sometimes after you screw it down, you'd have to, away from the graphics card, you'll pull on it and pull it upward to bend the metal of it. And then push it back down just with a tiny bit of force and put it right under your graphics card. That's That way it's actually pushing up on your graphics card. But we're not using this type of bolster, we're using the one I'm showing in this video, the big long one, specifically for full towers. So with the MSI bolster here, both ends have these little uh, rubber pieces. You just uh, unscrew. You only have to un unscrew one side, and it comes with these. And these can also be used for multiple graphics cards too, if you have another board that supports uh, multiple graphics cards, kind of like this one does. But nonetheless, as you can see, it pushes down. We're gonna uh, hold this thing in here. I guess it's hard to do this one hand. But as you can see here, push it down, goes on the inside. And then we'll have that piece there. It's gonna go on this little here and it's gonna lift it up as we, you know what I'm saying? As we uh, let it lift up. So we need to figure out which side is gonna be uh, pumped up and it's and that's actually gonna fit in the tower. I believe it was this way last time I used it because I did use this in this tower before. I believe that this portion for this tower would have to be top and not the bottom, but we're gonna see anyway. If I let it lift all the way up and then let it hit the inside, it goes pretty high. So I would either A, have to have this, like so, the rubber part would have to obviously be facing toward the graphics card. So I'd either have to slide it on the bottom here, right here. And then I can also just adjust this as needed via the screw and just slide it as needed. But it's just a lot easier just to have the bottom portion on the bottom because then I can just do this. I could put it at the bottom of the tower, then literally push it down and then let it go up automatically. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to slide this on the bottom here, and the only way I can do that though is I want to remove this here. I feel like I'm putting a fucking sniper together. <laughs> sniper rifle. <laughs> Here's the silencer. <laughs> oh shit. Put the other one, this other piece back on. All right, so you see here, I'm putting it at the bottom. I'm gonna push it down. I'm gonna let it lift up. You gotta make sure that the both rubber uh, ends are just like sitting on the edge of the inside of the tower. It's just not pushing up on anything. So as you can see, there's too much too much space between the, uh, the thing that's supposed to lift it up in the graphics card. So all I literally have to do is I have to just adjust this thing here and just slide this up more. Okay. Now, if you also notice, whatever, it's uh, too, it's right on the fan. Obviously, your graphics card turns on and the computer's running. It's really going to stop that fan from spinning, which we do obviously not want. So we want to make sure that this thing of the bolster is on in the middle of two fans. So let's go ahead and just move this over. Oh shit, right there, that's good. Slide this over. As you can see, so make sure it's just on the middle of both those fans. And then we're gonna, we're just gonna slide this up just a little bit, not a lot, just a little bit. You don't really have to have it push on the graphics card, but as long as it's like touching it, it's okay. Then we're just gonna go ahead and Obviously tighten this down, that way it can't slide anymore. And there you go, graphics card is officially installed. Like I said, when we lift it completely up, then the, the way the graphics card will not damage the motherboard or itself via the, the chip that's you know plugged into the port. All right, next thing we're gonna be putting inside is our power supply. So as you can see in the very, very back, we're gonna be plugging in our power cord at. You got your power switch, obviously. The dash turns it on so you can actually press the power button on the tower circle obviously turns it off and then eco mode all eco mode does for power supplies is there's a fan underneath it 
to cool off the power supply. Eco mode, just if you turn it on, it just doesn't spin the fan at all unless it needs to. If you have eco mode off, this fan in the power supply will spin pretty much all the damn time. So I do highly recommend go ahead and turn eco mode on because it can save on your electric bill. Anyways, obviously not all power supplies will have that, but it's an amazing thing to have because it, it helps with your electricity bill. As you see in the backhand side here, the, well, obviously our side from the power switch and stuff, uh, you got all of our ports. You got our SATA ports, which is basically for our... Oh, yeah, don't worry. There's nothing in there. It looks like, it was, it looks like, like a piece of paper inside or something. But it's not it's just the angle of my camera. Be my SATA ports, that's for your like CD and DVD drives, as well as uh, your hard drives and SSDs and stuff like that. Unless you have an NVMe drive, an NVMe drive does not use a, it's not really a SATA cable, it's a SATA power cable, I guess, if you will. Anyways, your MB is your motherboard power cable. This really, uh, there's CPU 1, CPU 2, you might be confused on that. Well, because there's only one processor, so why is there two processor ports? Well, funny you should ask, this really depends on the processor. They'll plug into both ports on the uh, motherboard. I'll show you later. So anyways, uh, VGA is obviously your graphics card. Now, as you'll notice, there's VGA 1, VGA 2, and VGA 3, 4, and 5. You know, this is, you know, suits multiple graphics cards as well as different ports on it. Because as you can see on the graphics card, there are 1, 2, 3. So, and all three of those will plug into all three of these on the graphics card. All right, so as you see by each cable, they are all literally labeled. Imagine that. SATA, CPU, CPU, MB, see, they're all right fucking there. Now, depending on motherboard, when it comes to the processor, some motherboards only have one, some have two. If they have two, you might as well plug two into both, okay? It's just, just be on the safe side just in case your processor needs the extra power. So that's exactly what we're going to do as we plug them all in and stuff. So anyways, so SATA into SATA. It only goes in one way. Now keep in mind when it comes to the SATA, you might not need more than one SATA power cable for the power supply. Why? Well, because as you can see by the end of the SATA, there's one, two, and three. So unless you're plugging a hard drive and a CD DVD drive and stuff like that, or if they're maybe too far apart and you need an extra wire by plugging into a SATA 2 port and having an extra set and stuff like that to reach it all the way to the top. If you have a tower with the drive bay, like I mentioned earlier in this video, slide it on a guardrail and it locks into place and yada, 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 it pops out in the front on the back of it to power it. One of these will slide into the back of it. And then you'll use another cable called a SATA cable that plugs in next to it then it plugs into a SATA port on the motherboard that easy one to power it one to have the computer be able to read it that easy so power supply cable to power the devices and depending on the device you'll have another cable that plugs directly into the motherboard so the motherboard can read it so you'll be able to access it in windows get that out of the way then cpu in cpu one as you can see the little thing i said only goes in one way CPU 1, another CPU, and 2, CPU 2, since our motherboard has 2 CPU power ports, and they're labeled, it literally says CPU power 1, CPU power 2, so we need 2 power cables for the CPU, common sense, you'll probably notice motherboard actually has 2, even though it's labeled kind of backwards, this one and this one, this right here is, is not to be confused with the SATA, Okay, so with the motherboard cord, there's one big ass one. There you go. You got one big one and one small one. Guess which goes where? That's right. Get the fucking wires out of the damn way. Big, well, second big one on the wire <laughs> goes into the big port of the MB slot of the power supply. And this smaller one goes right next to it. And as you're pushing all of them in, make sure they are clicking all the way in. It's going to be difficult, especially first run through. Brand new power supplies and brand new wires. The plastic is brand new and it's going to be a fucking pain in the ass to push all the way in without hurting your fingers. So, yeah. Now let's move on to the graphics card. Now this one might be confusing. You got 
three ports for this graphics card, depending on your graphics card. Some graphics card have two, some have one if you have a weaker graphics card. But this one has three, so we'll have to use three VGA ports. However, here's the issue. There's several different kinds. There's a VGA cable, like so, one port to one port. So it's basically one end to one end, okay? Some actually split into two. So you got this end, and then on the other end, it splits into two. Now, there's two ways to use these cords because chances are when you have a power supply and you have three ports on a graphics card, you are not going to have three single port wires on each end. Three of the, these exact wires here. Chances are you're only gonna get two of these and your third one is going to be split at the end. Now, you can either A, on the third, very, very end one, you can use the split one, and then all you'd have to do is plug in the corner one and just leave this one, you know, hanging, or you can use an adapter like this. I don't know if your power supply will come with this or not, but I have one spare hand, and I don't know where the hell it came from, but I got lucky, so it's whatever. And what this does is you can just plug in the, you know, the one end that goes in the power supply from VGA3, the other end that splits into two, you can plug in the two, and it turns it into one plug. So I'm just gonna go ahead and do that, like so. So now, plug in our one to one end plug into VJ1. But the end where it like splits into a smaller one, that goes in the graphics card. So we're gonna shove that aside, we're gonna plug this one, the one that's all in one, that plug. And that is gonna go into VJ1. Damn it, what the hell? Same thing with this one. This VJ, the one plug to one plug, is going to VGA2. And then, of course, the only core we have left that I plugged into an adapter to convert into one plug at the end, okay, is going to plug into VGA3. Now, before we can plug it all in, we'll have to actually put it inside the tower first. So, this big fucking square back here. It's quite obvious. We're going to put the side that has the switch, the power switch, in like that. But we might have to take the graphics card bolster out, unfortunately. We could also put the tower on its side because you don't want to mess with the graphics card unless the tower is on its side. So you don't risk damaging the motherboard pin or the graphics card chip that they're both connected to each other with. Uh, and obviously we'll have to move out these wires out of the way first. Common sense. Just gotta push this all the way back. And before we plug anything in, we can go ahead and close this a little bit, the glass door. And as you can see, power uh, supply in the back. So obviously as you see, hole, 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 hole. We'll have to put screws in and you might have to use one hand to keep pushing the power supply back against the tower here while you're screwing in the back. Now the cool thing about this tower is that you do not have to take the glass panel off this. This actually comes right off, like so. You lift it all the way up and both ends come off. Keep in mind, however, it is a pain in the ass to evenly get both hinges completely even to slide back down again. And this is why I said that having Allen wrenches handy is extremely good, especially for this tower or whatever tower you're getting for your computer, because sometimes these will pop right off and you'll have to just push them back down on the door here and you'll have to use an Allen wrench to tighten it back up to keep the hinges on the glass. Otherwise, your computer is not going to have any uh, siding, specifically for this tower though. Alright, power supply is officially screwed in. Sometimes you might even have to maneuver around a little bit from the other side to line up with the holes. And also keep in mind, as you notice, all the screws are even except this one. So it's never ever going to be perfect. Well, depending on the tower. <laughs> first things first, we want to plug in the motherboard. Motherboard into Motherboard, it's right here on the right hand side. Usually nine times out of 10. Matter of fact, it is the only port on the whole motherboard that's the exact same size as this one. <laughs> so self-explanatory. There's a little clip here and there's a little ledge there. So we know the clip goes on the right hand side. 
Line it up, push it all in. So it clicks. You'll have to put some effort into it. Ah, there we go. All right, let's go ahead and move the SATA cable out of the way a little bit. Just guide through it. And we're just moving it out of the way because it will be last. This is what's gonna plug into our SSD, AKA our extremely fast hard drive. That Windows is gonna be installed too. Okay, next is gonna be the CPU, the processor. So we had CPU one and CPU two back there. Okay, we gotta figure out which wire is which. Okay, here's CPU one. So, guide it the hell out of the way and it's going to be the top left hand side and if you're still not sure where the hell it's on your motherboard refer to your motherboard manual as always so there's well eight plugs all together and there's four each so all you have to do is just make sure they are completely next to each other and there's only one way to do it there's the ledge at the top so the clips would have to be at the top just make sure they are together when plugging it in to the top and push them both down side by side until they both click in. For the processor, it is completely okay to do them one at a time. For the graphics card, not so much. And you'll see what I mean when we get to that. All right, next is obviously our CPU two. So let's find where the hell that wire is at. I'll plug that one into the only one left. You do not have to use both of them. Just use one of them, obviously. Because there's only four plugs. Four plugs. You cannot possibly use both of them, obviously. Just make sure the extra one that's hanging, just move it out of the way. And make sure it doesn't hit the, obviously if you have a uh, liquid CPU fan, that it doesn't hit that at the top. All right, now we're gonna do our graphics card. Fun, fun, fun. This one's a little more complicated and I'll show you why. So, we have to figure out which one is VGA1 first. So VGA1 is all the way back there. It's gonna guide it here. Okay, it's this one. Okay, so, when you look at this, you'll notice there's obviously two different plugs. A big one and a small one. Now unfortunately, as you can see here, they are, there's like a little ledge. These ledges have to be, it's like playing Tetris. The small one has to basically go in first. And it has, they have to connect like that. So it kind of looks like a snake is like resting his head on a fucking curb, I guess. <laughs> okay? They have to be just like that. Now if, if you find it easier to hold them together like this, the one plugging it in, do so. Just understand that sometimes they have a tendency to come apart when you're plugging them in, and it's extremely fucking stressful sometimes. Because, like I said, the small one has to go in first. The clip part faces down. So VJ1, the VJ1 cord, goes into the first port of the graphics card. I made that fucking look easy. Usually it's fucking hard. <laughs> Next is VJ2. And unfortunately, it's gonna be hard to find it because all these fucking wires are in the way and I can't find the damn label. So I have to like tilt my head down and look under there and duck and all that fun bob and weave shit. All right, so I found the VGA2 cord and I line them up. The snake's head is on the fucking curb. <laughs> Let's go to the second one. And then you guessed it, last but not least, VJ3, the cord that I used an adapter with to change the two ended to a one end. And it makes it so much easier to, as you can see, that they're not split into two. So, you just plug that straight into there. Three. Like so. VJ1, VJ2, VJ3. Or, instead of having this adapter here that I showed earlier that turns the cord that goes from one end to two, like so, you can just plug in the corner and plug the corner into the third port of the graphic card instead. And just leave the other one right here hanging. Like so. Okay. Like I say, you do not have to use an adapter like this, especially if you don't have one that turns the two ended one into one plug. You don't have to use this adapter or this cord that goes from you know one end to two end if you have three of these cords. If you're lucky enough to get three of these cords, one end to one end, one end 
to one end, then you'll be golden. But like I said, most power supplies don't come with three, one end to one end for the graphics card. The third one is usually almost always a one end to two end, and you just plug in the corner one and leave the end hanging unless you have an adapter like this. Easy peasy. Now we have to plug in our, you guessed it, solid state drive. Without this, we obviously cannot install Windows because this is our hard drive. An extremely, extremely fast hard drive, mind you. But as you can see here, there is two different ports. There is Luther port and another Luther port. That's really small. One is the power. The other is for a SATA cable. We're going to plug directly in the motherboard. Can you guess which one's which? Alrighty then. Time's up. The big one is for the power supply. And the small one is for the motherboard. So let's go ahead and plug in, obviously, the only SATA from the power supply. I like to plug the hard drive, aka or SSD, whatever you're using, into the first one. So it loads up the hard drive first. I don't think it matters though. Line up the big one with the big one. All right, done. Push all in. The only thing we have left is, guessed it, your motherboard should come with these. If it doesn't, or if it didn't, then you'll have to get some. Just make sure that your SATA cables are six gigabit a second. It should say on the wire somewhere here. Right there, SATA, six gigabit a second. All right, now the cool thing about SATA cables, it doesn't matter which end. Some SATA cables are flat on both ends. Some have one flat end and the other end is hooked like an L. Sometimes you uh, will come across cable management where everything's so crunched together that you're not going to be able to even use the flat portion. Or you might not even be able to use the hooked portion. Plugging in like that and in the motherboard, this bottom part of the wire can get in the way of some things. Like I said, if you come across that, you just switch this uh, wire around. It does not matter. The plug is the exact same on both ends. Now, if you don't know where your SATA ports are, refer to your motherboard manual. However, on this one, unfortunately, the graphics card's kind of covering them. <laughs> and I don't think I would have to remove the graphics card, but you can see I'll zoom in back there. Right there, where that little white barcode sticker's at is where the SATA ports are. Also, it does not matter which port you plug it into. Just pick one. So, I have the hooked in plugged into the smaller part of the SSD, and then the other end... I'm going to be plugging in to those uh, SATA ports back there behind that graphics card I just said where that white barcode <laughs> sticker is. Remember, it only goes in one way, so figure it out. Just make sure you plug it all the way in until it clicks down, just like everything else I showed you. This is also the exact same installation way if you want to install an internal Blu-ray or CD, DVD, reader and writer inside your tower, depending on what tower you got exact same cords you'll have one cord from the power supply the, the sata power cable and then you'll also have a regular sata cable plug into the other end right next to that into the uh, cd slash dvd slash blu-ray reader and writer we need to plug our remote control from the liquid cpu cooler that i plugged in earlier i showed you guys how to plug it and stuff like i said this is only for liquid cooler for your cpu if you buy one if you only got a cpu fan you don't gotta worry about the our remote controller or these three cords right here adapter all that shit or these three fans up here or this piping here now that shit you get the general idea what we're gonna do is uh the static we uh shoved aside earlier the one in the front here guide it find it and our her okay one two three all we have to do is plug in the other end is right there SATA power and you can plug it into any one of these and then I also might as well plug in the uh, only one fan I could get use more fans and put them in the front of the tower here to have like three different lights kind of like my computer tower over here except it's not three lights it's two and that filter right there needs to be uh, clean because has so much dust on it as you can see <laughs> holy crap so, same thing, I fed the fan wire to the side, it was already at the side, but I fed it to the inside, and then here's the wire, again, I can plug this into any system fan port.
literally every single fan that you install on the inside of your tower on the sides like in the front the back or the top literally all of them will plug into your available sys fan porch you know what i showed earlier with the motherboard ports sys fan one sys fan two so on and so forth all the way to six to eight depending on how many sys fan ports your motherboard has will depend on how many fans you can install inside your case all right we are ready for action all we gotta do is push all this wires back in there as well as put the uh solid state drive on one of these little things here and we are ready for action done now even though it doesn't really look the best it doesn't matter we just need to see if it actually boots up and starts working or not i can always open the case later on with the computer shut off and like unplug the processor and guide these wires behind the bolster. I can still close the glass door on it. It still shuts. I've done it before. This will drive me insane, so I'm probably gonna have to, once we see if the computer works, actually you know, rearrange where these wires is behind this thing. All right, and with the bolster, we have to still make sure that the it is not touching the fans, so make sure it's in between the fans instead so it doesn't stop the GPU fans from spinning. And if your motherboard came with these little antennas for Wi-Fi, since this motherboard is uh, Wi-Fi enabled, we can really turn our desktop computer wireless. There is two coaxial ports on the motherboard. Right there. Boom, boom. Screw them in, and you can even, like, bend them and everything. Done. Pretty fucking sweet. Nifty, if you ask me. You look like alien antennas. <laughs> All right, let's plug our power cable in to the power supply over here. Okay, make sure eco mode is on. So we don't run up our electric bill. The power, the power supply fan, like I said earlier, because the eco mode only affects the uh, power supply fan, so it doesn't run constantly. It doesn't need to run constantly. Then we're gonna put the glass door back on and uh, uh, yeah. All right, so I have the power cord plugged in and straight into the wall. I have it actually turned on with the minus thingy. And eco mode is also turned on, so we can save a fuck ton on our electric bill. And you can use an HDMI cord instead of a display port cord for your screen, okay? This is also if you ever wanna plug in your computer into your flat screen TVs, you know, just like consoles can, you know, you know what I'm saying? Now, the thing is, if you are not, not running a graphics card, then you would plug in an HDMI cord directly into the motherboard. Again, this is if you're not running a graphics card then you can plug it into the motherboard. And this is also if your processor even supports integrated graphics, which I explained the very, very, very beginning of this fucking video, <laughs> okay? Quad cores or lower, usually have integrated graphics, but they're not powerful enough to allow you to play high graphical games. Since it has integrated graphics, you would plug in the HDMI cord directly into the HDMI port of the motherboard and then the processor itself have an integrated graphics well is just powerful enough to give you a display and allow you to play like 2D games like Minesweeper and Super Nintendo type fucking game, you know what I'm saying? But if you are running a graphics card, if you are running a graphics card, then you plug in the HDMI cord directly into the graphics card instead. So again, if you're not running a graphics card, plug in the HDMI cord into your motherboard. If you are running a graphics card, plug the HDMI cord into your graphics card. Okay? Alrighty then. One more thing. Some motherboards, even with integrated graphics with the quad core and lower processors, they might have what's called a DVI port, which is like the old cords you can just plug directly in and then screw down on each side, okay? This is why it's always important to refer to your motherboard manual. That's outdated anymore because most motherboards nowadays use HDMI over DVI, okay? So keep that in mind as well. And plug in the internet cord, the ethernet cord obviously. And I also went ahead and plugged in my wireless keyboard and mouse. This is to my keyboard and I plugged in my wireless mouse to the front. So now let's see if it actually boots up. Let's open this up. 
Ready? Here we go. We're gonna hit the power button on the tower. Now, of course, if it stays on for more than five to 10 seconds, you're golden. Once you know for a fact it's actually running and it's stayed on for more than five to 10 seconds, like I said, then we're gonna go ahead and turn it off via the power button. Press and hold the power button to turn it off. And then we're gonna proceed to the next step. Actually getting Windows on a USB flash drive and installing it to our new built computer.